Okay, I'm going to call this meeting to order. I apologize that it, we're starting late. We had a lot of items on our closed session that we had to take care of, so I'm very sorry about that. Um, would you go ahead? Okay. The City of San Clemente respects the many people of different faiths who reside here. The City Council historically begins its session with an invocation offered by one of the religious leaders of our community with full appreciation of our shared belief that we are one nation under God. And while the city cannot endorse any particular religion, we respect the religious freedom and freedom of expression of all our citizens to pray as they feel led to pray. This evening's invocation will be given by Holland Davis, senior pastor with Calvary Chapel San Clemente. Right. Please stand for the invocation and remain standing for Councilmember Donchek uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for bringing us together for the purpose of um, seeking your wisdom on governing our city. And I pray for each of our council members that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them direction and guidance, Lord, that you would bless them abundantly, that your favor would be upon their families, that your favor would be upon their businesses, that your favor would be upon their personal lives and their health, Lord. And we pray this, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as pillars sculptured and palace style, that our barns may be full, supplying all kinds of produce, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields, that our oxen may be well laden, that there be no breaking in or going out, that there be no outcry in our streets, for happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And we just thank you for these servants of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Councilmember Donchak. Councilmember Ham. Councilmember Swartz. Here. Mayor Potem Brown. Here. Mayor Ward. Here. First item on the agenda is an update by staff concerning the proposed toll road. I don't have an update at this time. Anyone? Uh, 
I can give an update as a director uh, of the TCA real quick. I had a tour last week uh, from the engineers on the TCA of where the proposed alignment would be that went through San Clemente. One of the things that I was very shocked or surprised about was that the toll road, the where they're thinking is that they will not connect to the Pico interchange because they will uh, harm that interchange in the way it works. They want to connect further south. That means it will connect much closer to the high school than even we anticipated. We thought that they were going by a, an original EIR uh, that had the connection kind of going on the mountain below uh, St. Andrew's Church and kind of flying around uh, and connecting at the interchange. And they said they are not looking at that. And also they advised that that EIR is not valid anymore and that they uh, have to do a, an entirely new EIR. This is completely different news than even I knew. But uh, I was surprised at how close it goes to the football field. It would fly over Caro's and there would be a post or a pole somewhere in the back there in the Caro's McDonald's area and it would cut very close to uh, that open area next to the freeway, right next to the field. So that was surprising because we, we had those drawings. Those are not valid is, is what I'm being advised. Whether that's true or not, this was just an impromptu uh, tour. It also comes close to uh, the homes behind Del Rio, who already have Del Rio coming to them at La Pata it would come uh, very close there. So there was some surprises, but if anyone wants a, more of an update, I can give that. And for all those that are uh, punching in the forum, letters online, uh, social media, addressing emails to the city council here uh, regarding that you oppose uh, the TCA toll road, just to let you know, we've already have a 5-0 opinion of opposing it so you're preaching to the choir so I would rather those letters go to all the ones that are actually on record opposing it so uh, when as we weed through the hundreds of emails we get uh, we're not reading a lot of the same things that we already do we're already supporting I don't think we can go any further supporting than we already have as far as uh, uh, avoidance of, of not allowing them to come through our town so, can't hear me? Lori. Uh, and then, um, as you know, Mayor Ward and I are at the uh, subcommittee for the uh, TCA Toll Road Task Force for, with my OCTA hat on coming to the Regional Highways and Planning Committee at OCTA this Thursday is um, a project um, a discernment for taking the HOV toll, HOV lane on the I-5 down to the San Diego border. And your city council has asked for that to be looked at because we're very committed not to dividing communities, to looking for arterial solutions that don't build new roads. And uh, there is a possibility that that piece of the HOV lane going from Pico to the San Diego County could be part of the mobility solution. So that'll go to the OCTA, Regional Highways and Planning Committee on Thursday, onto the full board shortly after that. And then uh, we'll make a presentation here at, at uh, City Council on the results of that. I just want to make a couple comments. Yes, you go ahead. From the public. We have speaker cards. So uh, I just want to make a couple comments before we hear from the community this evening. The first one is uh, I'd just like to apologize to any of the environmental groups that have worked so hard to protect San Onofre for future generations and make it clear that I do not support under any circumstances the toll road expanding one inch past where it currently ends now at Oso Parkway. And I look forward in the future to working with all groups and opposing the TCA in any endeavors they have in the future because I think together we're much stronger, united, as a community with Rancho Mission Viejo, San Juan Capistrano, San Clemente, environmental groups standing together to oppose a toll road through South Orange County. So I want to thank them for their hard work and uh, I look forward to working with everybody in the future. Thank you. Okay, so we do have one uh, public comment card. Is that for it? Your name's not on it. Oh, did I not write my uh, name? So come on up and I'll write your I'll name on it. Mark McGuire. 
Okay, sorry about that. I'm okay. Mark McGuire, the blank person who wanted to speak. Um, and I, I do realize, uh, Mayor Ward and members of the council, that there is a certain amount of preaching to the choir, but we also are trying to get information out to the community of those folks that watch. So I'm trying to come every every week or every, every hearing uh, and speak for three minutes. Um, but in addition to preaching to the choir, we have gone out to the uh, to to other communities and to other, in, including elected officials in other communities. And one of the things that I've found recently that I, I'm encouraged by is there are many people out there uh, in Ladera uh, and in Mission Viejo and San Juan who all already are on record um, saying that they want Los Patronas to stay a free road. Uh, and they've uh, submitted their written testimony to the Board of Supervisors and others to that effect. And I, and I think that's going to be really important. If we can keep the pressure on and keep Los Patronas free, we're down the, down the road, sorry for the metaphor, uh, to keeping the toll road from going one more inch. And I, and I endorse what uh, Councilman Member Ham said. I, I don't want that road. I don't believe that that road needs to go another inch past where it's already uh, been approved. So I endorse that 100%. Um, I think the last time I was here, I told you about the 1992 EIR that assumed that the road would be built by 2010 and that it would be toll free by 2010. And I just find that fascinating that that was the assumption that they made in that EIR. But it got me to thinking and a, and a statement that a member, that a council member from Dana Point said also got me to thinking. He said, you know, there really should have been a sunset on this TCA. Um, if the, because they haven't accomplished that final mission. In fact, I don't think the final mission to complete that segment is compelling anymore. Times have moved on. We've got better ways to solve the traffic problems than the solution that they were tasked with back in, in the late 80s. And it's, it, it made me start to think, why don't we work uh, to get some special legislation to uh, make sure that the TCA doesn't spend any more money on additional roads or additional facilities at all that can't be cost justified just on their own merits. In other words, don't use money that you already have coming in from your toll revenue to, to try to continue this road. If this road doesn't stand on its own merits financially, which I don't think it can even come close to doing, then I don't think it's a road that, that should be authorized by any legislation. Um, I also think that um, if we uh, task the TCA or if legislation tasks the TCA to, spend, to save as much money as possible instead of spend as much money as possible, they should be able to open these roads back up sooner than what, they're, what the current dates are, which right now the 73 is set to open up in, in 2050 and the 241 in 2053. So if I just can have 10 more seconds, I'll finish. So I think if we can push them to just focus on the task at hand, which is save money, pay down their debt, and make the roads free like they were always promised. I think we can do more for traffic relief by doing that than having them uh, pursue this folly of an extension of the 241. Thank you. Thank you. So is there any other comment about the toll road? OK. I'm sorry, did you fill out a card? Okay, you can fill out another card. No, okay. Okay. Next item is presentation of a proclamation to Bertie Lloyd, Daughters of the American Revolution, proclaiming September 17th through the 23rd as Constitution Week. Okay. <clears throat> I wanted to thank you for the proclamation, but I want to give you some background information. In 1955, the Daughters of American Revolution petitioned Congress to set aside September 17th to the 23rd annually for the observation of Constitution Week, a time of education, remembrance, and celebration. It was on September 17th, 1787, that the United States Constitution was signed by 40 of our forefathers. The resolution was later signed into law <clears throat> excuse me, in 1956 by Dwight David Eisenhower. Our chapter members will meet at Mission San Juan Capistrano on Sunday, September 17th, where the bells will ring exactly at 1 p.m. In celebration of the signing of the Constitution, this is a national-wide event called Bells Across America. We hope the mayor and the city council members and the rest of you join us 
on the 17th, the bell ringing in San Juan. And thank you for the proclamation. I want to thank you for doing this every year and reminding everyone how important it is to understand the provisions and principles and the meaning of the Constitution uh, so that they can support it, preserve it, and defend it against encroachment. So uh, I want to thank you for doing that. And uh, uh, we declare September 17th, marking the 228th anniversary of the drafting of the Constitution of the United States of America. So thank you very okay. much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Next is presentation of a certificate of recognition to Kendall Steyer for demonstrating athletic achievement. Oh. Okay. Uh, before you speak, Kendall, uh, I would like to recognize you in honor of your outstanding academic and athletic achievement. Uh, you. Have quali you qualified for the 2017 CIF track and field state finals in the girls' wheelchair division for shot put. You hold the 2016 CIF state record for girls' wheelchair division shot put and remains undefeated in California. Uh, I know that you uh, are listed as an adaptive athlete, and what you're going to do tonight is explain that, uh, what that is for people. And so I commend you on trying to raise awareness uh, for this in our state, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Ward and City Council. Thank you so much for this honor that you have given me. After I won the track and field state championship in 2016 for seated shot put, I promised Mayor Baker and City Council that I would dedicate myself to one day make it on Team USA. The best and the worst thing happened to me June when I qualified for CIS state finals and national championships only to figure out that both competitions were going to be at the same day at the same time. My mother and my coach left the decision, decision to me. On June 2nd, I decided to forgo CIS state championships for a chance at the national title. It was a tough choice, but one that I do not regret. While I am proud to hold the state and national championship titles, I am more passionate about informing other disabled high school athletes who are often rejected when it comes to sports. I have come to tell them that a new day has come. True inclusion is now state and federal law. I need your help to get the message out. One out of every 10 high school students in the state of California have a documented physical disability. Many of them do not know that they can now join their high school track and field teams and compete for CIF titles. Most of them do not know that the Eastern Conference is now allowing adaptive athletes to score in NCAA title games. We are talking about a quarter of a million high school athletes in California who have no idea they can play and compete in sports and perhaps earn a scholarship. There is no doubt that state and federal laws change in order to prepare all high school athletes who want to compete in the Olympics and Paralympics. California will become a feeder state with some of the greatest world champions being born, raised, and trained on this ground. I know that the road ahead of me is long and challenging to make Team USA. However, I will continue to fight for the gold. I wish to represent the city of San Clemente by showing others if there's a will, there's a way. Inviting para-athletes to high school sports is inclusion for all. I dedicate all my performances to God and give him all the glory. Thank you, Mayor Baker and City Council for your support. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I can remember... Uh, Mayor Baker wanting you to come and do this and congratulating yeah. you. So I hope he's watching tonight and mm -hmm. seeing this. So I just want to say on behalf of the City Council that we are so proud of you for uh, what you've done and that you are trying to raise awareness mm -hmm. and have uh, other student athletes be able to compete because it means so much to them. It has meant so much to you. So I would like to congratulate you. Thank can, you so much. And I think they want to take your picture. Is, oh. Can you do that? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Let's see. You want some help? I'll hold this for you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Here, I can. Thank and you, so much. you have a ring on. What is that ring for? That's the state That's champion. That's the state champion. Okay. I don't know if they can see us. Very nice. You you deserve that ring. Thank you it's so much. It's very shiny. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Okay. Now, let's make sure I have the right order here. Uh, would Christina McDivitt please come up? Next is going to be Uh, Christina, I'm going to give you this proclamation uh, certificate. Uh, says, whereas uh, this is uh, to recognize uh, September as being the World uh, World Alzheimer's Month uh, for this entire month, and uh, our proclamation says, whereas Alzheimer's disease, a progressive neurodegenerative brain disorder, tragically robs individuals of their moments and leads to progressive mental and physical impairments. Um, whereas more than 84,000 residents in Orange County and over 5 million Americans are currently living with this disease. Um, each year, family caregivers provide 1,139 hours of care per individual with Alzheimer's. So we recognize that it is significant uh, to all the family members. Um, I would like to say, therefore, I, Kathy Ward, Mayor of C City of San Clemente, acting on behalf of the City Council and the citizens of San Clemente, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2017 as World Alzheimer's Awareness Month. And I think you're going to talk a little bit yes. about that. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Can I have these? Oh, thank you. Hello, my name is Christina McDivitt, and I'm an advocate for Alzheimer's Orange County. On behalf of Alzheimer's Orange County, I want to thank the mayor, mayors of the council, and the city of San Clemente for acknowledging September as World Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Today, there are more than 84,000 Orange County residents and 47 million people worldwide living with Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia, and that number will triple by 2025. Since 1982, Alzheimer's Orange County has been the county's largest local nonprofit organization dedicated to, to providing free education, support, and advocacy to people and families living with memory loss. We are so grateful for your help in raising awareness about the devastating impact of Alzheimer's disease and invite you to take the first step towards a dementia-free community by participating in our Walk for Alzheimer's. The Walk for Alls is the county's largest community event to raise awareness and to bring us one step closer to finding a cure. Each year, over 10,000 people participate in our Walk for Alls, uniting the entire community in the fight against dementia. If you or anyone you know is in need of our services, please reach out to our 24-7 helpline staffed with social work professionals. Visit our website at alzoc.org. Again, thank you, Mayor and City Council members of San Clemente for joining Alzheimer's Orange County as we recognize September as World Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Thank you. It's okay if we take a picture? Yes. Let's see. Are we going to do a selfie? Maybe come to take Wait. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Let's see. Thank you very much. So, Christina, I noticed uh, the uh, motto on this is "We Remember." Yes. That's is that the motto of your organization? Um, one of them. Yes. One of them. Yeah. That's tremendous. That's well, a good thank one. You. Thank you for coming thank out tonight. It was really thanks. amazing. Thank you. Okay, and I know in the agenda, we have it here that, okay, that uh, Councilmember Swartz is going to do an uh, update on the adoption of the shelter. So we're going to take that out of order and do it after. Okay. So I would like to call Tanner Salgado up to the podium. Tanner, you entered the Orange County's 2017 Echo Poster Challenge. You attend Bernice Ayers Middle School. Is that still current? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, the Orange County Waste and Recycling held the art contest to challenge Orange County children between the ages of 8 and 14 to illustrate the benefits of food and green waste recycling. And whereas this is the fifth annual contest, which is in partnership among uh, with OCWR, Discovery Cube OC, and Angels Baseball. 
Whereas the 2017 Echo Challenge poster contest themed Battling for a Green Planet selected one winner from each of the Orange County's five supervisorial districts, you won for the fifth district. His drawing and um, <laughs> congratulations. You can see up on the monitors uh, Tanner's drawing and I love the message, together we can do more together, but more than we're doing already. Is that, was that your message? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wanna say congratulations on that and thanking you for uh, caring about our planet. Take a quick picture. Sure. So congratulations on that. It's a, great, it's a great message and it was perfect for this challenge. So congratulations. So, um, years ago, the uh, city council and some of the meetings would highlight some of the animals because we are one of the few cities down in South County actually has our own shelter. So if you, anyone doesn't know where the shelter is, you just go on La Pata and go as far as you can go and you're there. So um, You might want to ask to have the f uh, that put on the TV. Oh, there yeah. you go. Thank you. So... Uh, we very special we have some, some of our special guests at our shelter that are looking for a home and we've asked each of them to write a little bit about themselves <laughs> so on the on this first one uh, we have hi I'm Fritzy I am a male neutered orange tabby cat two and a half years old and have a very inquisitive personality like most cats don't uh, I like to go for walks on my leash and harness and explore everything at the shelter I'm ready for a forever home. So that's Fritzy. And now we have Leo. Okay, Leo's here. He's at the shel shelter waiting for his forever home. Could it be you? He's a six-year-old male neutered Parson Russell Terrier mix. He likes to go for walks, play with our dogs, and he likes to cuddle. And he's sitting there waiting to cuddle with his new owners. And then we have Nemo. Nemo looks serious here. I am a super cool dude and staff favorite, male, neutered, two and a half years old, a tuxedo cat, and he's all dressed up to go. He's rescued by shelter staff after being abandoned at their front door. He's quite he has a quite captivating personality. And then we have Rusty. He's a lovely little guy with a, he's a great lap dog would be a great companion for a person or a family with a quiet home. He's a six-year-old male neutered chihuahua, and he's one of the favorites over at the volunteers at the shelter. So he's our last animal for tonight. Also let all our residents know that uh, there is a low-cost vaccine clinic on Wednesday, September 13th, 5 to 7 p.m., and you can come and get your, your dog's vaccine, vaccinated. And microchips are only like 15, are 15 bucks. That's pretty cheap. So, you know, protect your animals both by vaccination and by getting a chip so that should they rumble off for some reason during a thunderstorm or whatever, they'll find their way back home. Anyway, I want to thank you for your attention. And remember that our shelter is there. And if you're looking for a pet, that's really a great place to go to rescue one. <clears throat> Members of the audience who wish to address council on matters that are within the jurisdiction of the city of San Clemente, but not separately, separately listed on the agenda, may do so during the oral communications portion of the meeting. A total time limitation of 30 minutes is allocated for oral communications part one, with each speaker being allotted three minutes which to give his or her presentation and I do have some cards. Okay, so I'm going to call three names at a time. Please stand up behind each other. I'm going to call them in order that I got them. Uh, first speaker will be Anthony Lafrano, followed by C.L. Snyder, followed by Louise Herbert.
Good evening. Thank you, Anthony Lafrano, San Clemente. Let's keep Pico clean. This is my campaign. Would this be acceptable in our city? If this was the Pier Bowl or Talega, would this be acceptable in our city? This is acceptable. Why are we allowing this to be acceptable in our city? This is what Pico has become. The Pico corridor from I-5 to Hermosa is, is getting trashed on a daily basis. And we need to hold the property owners accountable. That's Marblehead and that's Rancho San Clemente. Yeah. This is right across from Union Bank on Pico. If you go right over here behind these bushes, this is the view from Pico, Pico and Del Cerro. I'm talking about right where my mouse is. Here's the street view. This is what it looks like behind there. So we need the property owner to come in here, clean up the weeds, clean up. It's just, it's, it's, it's not a very good look for San Clemente. And you can't see it from the road, but it exists. And there's many pockets of this on Pico. And this is what it looks like. It's disgusting. It's like Sanford and Son. Steve Schwartz, you were elected in November to be that guy who is going to come in here and, and solve these problems. So uh, I'm going to hold you accountable going forward as our elected official. Hopefully you can call the property owners and work with the Orange County Sheriff's Department to, to do something about this. First thing I would do is I would post no trespassing signs every 300 yards on Pico. You need about 12 more. And I think the city should share the costs with the property owners. Okay, this way there is no trespassing, and anybody who trespasses down in that canyon can be arrested. I would also ask uh, our chief of police if he can pull one of the quads from North Beach and come and, um, and drive that canyon. Make sure people aren't camping there. Make sure people aren't down there with propane tanks as they were two weeks ago, which is about 300 yards from my house. This is what it looks like from the aerial. All of these trails are not hiking trails. These are trails that people are using and they're camping illegally in the canyon. And all we need to do is go down there and make sure that they're not thrashing, destroying our city. Uh, I had a slide. Okay, so Mr. Schwartz, let's see what you can do. I think you can do it. I know you're new. I think the learning curve is six months in the job. So if I were you, I would call the, the property owners. Uh, I would call the HOAs. I'd say, hey, this is Steve Schwartz. We've got some residents complaining about how dirty your property is. We need to get it cleaned up. Thank you for your time. Mr. Snyder. C.L. Snyder, St. Clemente resident for 51 years. I want to thank you for what you've done to the pier. Uh, seagulls cannot land on the lamp posts anymore, the lights or the flagpole. Uh, it has cleaned up all the snow under those. It's great. It's almost finished. You know, the Pure Pride is working on it. That's good. So far, I have about almost two years invested in this project, and you've seen what it looked like a year ago. It's, you should take a look now. You wouldn't recognize below the light standards. I want to thank you again, the city council and the staff, and any city worker that was connected to it. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment to the pier, Mr. Snyder. And um, I'd like to give a special shout out to a staff member, Randy Little, who um, we were fortunate enough to have joined San Clemente from Santa Monica Pier, and he's brought a lot of best practices to the pier. So, Mr. Snyder, if you see Randy, give him a handshake. Thank you. Ms. Herbert. Thank you. I'm Louise Herbert, and I've been a resident of San Clemente for over 34 years. I live on the south end of town near the El Camino exit, the mass problem. Uh, the westbound southbound wall was erected for noise many years ago. Where do you think the noise went? It hasn't gone away, it's actually escalated. If you're familiar how the Hollywood Bowl works, so does the southbound wall. It's pushed all that noise straight up the hill, and the residents on the 
inland side, east side of the freeway have had extreme increases of noise. In the years since the uh, southbound wall was erected, traffic has increased. Proof of, this wide, uh, in, proof of this is in the widening of the freeway from South San, Clemente, or San Juan Capistrano to Palazada. There still is significant increase in traffic continuing from there south all the way into San Diego. But Caltrans seems to be ignoring this. I have spent months since May calling constantly, and I'm a newcomer to the project. But we keep hearing nothing in response from Caltrans. It's apparent since this um, evening we're still dealing with the toll road that traffic has increased, or we still wouldn't be playing with that ball in the air. According to Caltrans, funding, funding for the noise abatement walls no longer exists. They state that such walls can only be addressed and built when they are incorporated into a safety or enlargement widening project. If this is the case, then this project is a prime example of when it should be addressed and built now. I have learned that the project is to be built as a replacement of six feet four inches on that wall. So they knocked it down and will only build it to the same height. If in the future a sound wall is to be built, it will require, by Caltrans who, is, Caltrans, who has told me this, the destruction of this new wall that is being built right now, torn down to the base and rebuilt from the base up so that the bottom structure can withhold a 10-foot wall. We're talking three feet, eight inches of difference between now and what it should be. The stupidity of this logic baffles my mind. Why not build it to a 10-foot height now while it is at this stage of construction and avoid the waste of materials, money, and time, and the inconvenience to the drivers, not just in the neighborhood, but everybody who traverses this road? Caltrans fails to remember that they work for the tax-paying people of the state of California, and their blatant pacification and lack of face-to-face -face communication with residents is most affected, uh, is, is very deplorable, irritating and irresponsible. We were asking the City Council to work for the residents of South San Clemente to broker a face-to-face -face meeting with Caltrans ASAP and not miss the opportunity to rectify this construction oversight to create a northbound sound wall parallel to that of the southbound wall in a timely and cost-effective manner. If this is not possible, then we, as South San Clemente residents, will find it necessary to take to the streets in a rally between the north and southbound entrance and exits of the freeway along El Camino, Real. We would also invite the over 300 residents who have signed the petition to join us along with the local media to hear our concerns. I hope you take this seriously. It has been absolutely horrific. Chris, you know my fire marshal, Chris and Nicole, and we can't sleep with our windows open. And that's not, and also the J, you know, shifting down on the trucks, come spend a night at our house. Have Thank you. you. Have you sent that petition with signatures to the council yet? Yes, there's a gentleman by the name of Leonard Dunn who's been working with Caltrans. Yeah, can, can you send us a separate email? Because I know he's been working independently, but. This is the first he and I just met on, and I don't know if he's here this evening. I've never met him, yeah. but we've only been speaking on um, emails back and forth. And he's had contact with some of the same people, a lady by the name of Yvonne Washington. Okay. She's a conduit, and that's it. Um, not, not that that's wrong but yeah. she has no power she's a conduit and what is really disturbing with Caltrans are you aware that when they have they said that this was due to safety and if you look at the floor plan or the matrix of the exit on the northbound and the next exit on the southbound they're mirror images of one another and I asked her point blank were the accidents on the off-ramp or were they on El Camino Real because we have a postage size sign that is not even facing the off-ramp as of today. Yeah. It faces its whopper jawed that says, do not turn right on red light. And she said, mm, the accidents are on El Camino Real. Not on the off-ramp. Yeah. So this was bogus. OK. Can you, can you forward us that? Yes, the that petition. Yeah, that'd be great. I do have a, uh, the petition here if you and copy if you like. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so next speakers, uh, Marcia Mori and Habib Hosseini. 
George Gregory, Stacia Jones, and the last speaker is Mick O'Malley. And please state your names again in case I've said it incorrectly. It's, it's spelled very strange. Marsha Warren. Yours. My name is Habib Hosseini. Oh, I did well on that. Thank you. <laughs> and we have Carrie Canoni. Nice to see you again. First of all, I'm honored to be standing in front of the council, individuals who are serving the whole San Clemente. That's really a great honor. We are here to just mention that this year, 2017, is the bicentenary of the birth of Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. We are celebrating all over the world this year. And now we would like to <coughs> cordially invite you to the celebration. <coughs> That's going to be on Saturday, October 21st, 2017, at the Laguna Hills Community Center. A reception is at 6 p.m. Program starts at 7. And you will get the invitations. Close by. Oh, good. <laughs> great, great. And your spouses. And um, the invitations have gone out to all the councils in uh, South Orange County, and many of them have. Thank you. And many of them have uh, accepted. So it would be really wonderful to have you at this gracious celebration. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to see you again. Mr. Gregory. George Gregory, unvaccinated animal, North Beach, criminal. I'm asking the council again to agendize and correct the discriminatory laws that they select to discriminate against blue collar workers in this town. I did not move to a CCNR neighborhood, a nice neighborhood like Foster Ranch, because of the CCNRs. I moved to city proper, I call it. San Clemente has a law that issues tickets to guys who have a ladder on their truck or a lawnmower handle sticking out of the bed of their truck. Why other people can carry piles of bicycles in kayaks. This is a very discriminatory law and you are elected to correct the wrongs. You are elected to make our city proper. We know most people don't have a driveway in San Clemente, much less a garage. They need to work. They have a right to work. Calgers precedes almost the, 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 the what was that, England's Medicata or Medicata, something like that, and the Constitution, which ironically is Constitutional Month, against discrimination. This is a discriminatory law made by people who are just mean in spirit, and it's used to harass. Even our heroes, the Orange County Sheriff's Department, won't enforce it unless there's a complaint, which really makes it a harassment law. I think I'll harass the neighbor across the street because they have a ladder on their truck and they work. Now my neighbors don't like me unloading and loading up my ladder early in the morning and late at night. This is just totally mean and unnecessary. This is just as bad as the street sweeping law where we only give the people in the multi-family areas of our town a ticket for blocking the street sweeper because evidently we perceive our tires to be dirtier than the more wealthy people. Behave, council. It's time to behave. I ask the city manager to please copy this off. It's called, uh, the page out of Calgiers and, and, and agendize this. Please agendize this. It's time to talk about it. It's time to find out who is anti-blue collar in this council, especially when some of us have blue collar jobs. Any questions? This law almost sent me to jail. I almost lost my right to drive. I modified my truck. I tried to do everything right. There's a reason I don't live in a planned neighborhood like Talega. 
because I don't like Mrs. Kravitz. I don't want to live next to her. Thank you, Council. Any counts? Any questions? I have one question, George. Uh, you sent us a, a good amount of emails in regards to your uh, complaints for other people parking illegally in your neighborhood. I'm just curious, are you sending those complaints or forwarding them to Lieutenant Peters? I'm not a fink. Department? I'm not a fink, and I don't get paid to be a fink. I'm not a fink. Well, I'm just curious because most emails we get from you are complaining about other illegal vehicles in your it's, neighborhood. It's just why have, a, why have a law if we're not going to enforce it? Okay. We're just going to use a law to harass and harangue? No. Well, evidently we do. So you guys need to correct it. Please agendize it. Can we talk about agendizing it now? You can vote on it right now. You can agendize this next next meeting. Right now, you can agendize it. George, I, I don't have a question for you, but uh, I have an inquiry for the city manager, unless anybody else has a question. Go ahead. Thanks, George. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, it's, been, it's been a number of years. Actually, this preceded, Lori, I, you'll have to tell me of the history, but this preceded my tenure on the council. I think I was on the council. It was a whole year of fine tuning by, uh, led by now Captain Paul Dioria. Okay. All right. Uh, you know what? I think it would be, I'd like to get an update if possible from Captain Peters, obviously a fresh set of eyes, um, and uh, uh, during one of the council <laughs> meetings. Uh, before, we, before we do that, I, I, just, I see the look of disgust in Lori's face. I, and I just, I just want to share. I, hold on. I was laughing at the lieutenant's promotion. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Oh, sorry. sorry that you yeah, <laughs> share what happened because I took up uh, I took up George Gregory's flag when I first got on council because I had serious concerns about it as well, and I went through a whole slew of issues and those laws were uh, written with consistency for a specific reason and they're enforcing very required laws within the community and it's it's upsetting that George feels uh, singled out by it but everybody's being treated fairly amongst the community I can assure you there's reasons I absolutely 100% uh, agree with that I think that it's been a long time and most people here probably don't even remember why it is that we did this in the first place and I just would like to get an update on how how it's going so I don't want to reopen it as an agenda item okay. nor do I want to contemplate the policy but I'd like to hear from Lieutenant Peters and I will talk about Lieutenant it. We'll get Peters, back to you, me. yeah, uh, and give you guys a just give a an update because I, you know, how how we're enforcing it, and ultimately, if you know, if, if it's targeted or you know, just it, I think it's important. George is really very passionate about it, and he is a member of our community, one that um, that I think has a voice in this, and so I just like to make sure that we're we're balanced, that we're doing it the right way, and that you know we have an update that the that the law is continues to be relevant and, and important to our community. Okay. I, well, and I would also say that one of the big takeaways from the exercise originally was how do you enforce it? It has to be measurable, whatever the infraction is. So as you are looking at it, that was the, um, that probably took f three different meetings to get to a place where it wasn't c causing the officer to have to make a perception, uh, perceptual decision. Let me just offer to George as you walk back up. Anytime you want to discuss it one-on-one, -on -one, George. I think we discussed it a few years ago, but I'm willing to do it as well again. So yeah, I have a petition with 600 signatures, and you know, I've, Cox Cable a Corporation has more rights than an individual, a resident. You know, Cox Cable can afford their own damn yard. I can't. I'm always available to talk about her. Roger that. So could that update include the new uses, such as Cox and new I'll, vehicles that we're seeing? I'll get together with Lieutenant around. Peters and Captain Dioria, and the three of us will discuss it and go over the uh, ordinance in the past. Lieutenant Peters is new here. Uh, maybe with a new f set of eyes, he can uh, have some new examples that we can work through. So we'll put some time into it and send uh, send a memo to council on our findings. If council okay with it as well, I'll sit in just because there's a lot of things that I learned through the process, you know, going through it four years ago. Not input, but just to share the experiences that I had. So, okay. Okay. Next speaker is Stacia Jones, followed by Mick O'Malley. That's our last speaker. Okay. Um, first of all, because I do see some first responders in the room, on behalf of the football team at San Clemente, they're having a first responder appreciation on Friday, and you and up to four guests. If you just RSVP at tritonsfootball.com, get free tickets and a Chick-fil-A dinner. Nice. So anyway, hope to see you there. So we can pass the word along. Um, and in the same vein as George, um, I was here two years ago trying to uphold uh, city ordinances, and now I'm back. Um, I'm, I'm tired. I'm really tired of living on eggshells. And again, residents, long term, 25 years, not having as much rights as businesses. We um, have an ordinance about boarding homes. 
I lived in a zone area with that should uphold that and they're um, moving in happy to tell us they're moving in there will be six at least six people in and out all hours of the night one day two days 30 days we live on the canyon uh, I watched the people that have moved in flicking ashes those ashes could go over light up our canyon I can't sleep at night there's no parking there's no place for them there's not one piece of grass there are so many homes zoned in an area that boarding houses could more actively con conduct business and do whatever they're gonna do they're not zoned in my area they're there and they say they have a right to be there and they don't plan on moving <coughs> and like I said I fought this two years ago I'm here today with representing 26 of our neighbors who are all tired and it, it's just horrible that we can't have peace in our own home that my husband and I worked for every day of our lives and you know businesses win and I just wonder what you're going to do about it. We don't actually answer during this, usually. So, let's see. Did you have a suggestion? Okay. Yeah, um, we'd want to make sure that you called the code enforcement, Adam Atamian, at, at code enforcement. We can get his contact information. But all that information is very important. It sounds like nuisance activities and it doesn't even matter if it's a business. Those activities are, are prohibited. Can we, if you can give us your contact information, we can call you from so the city attorney's office. Uh, or several of the neighbors, we've been there. It's the chicken and the egg. Can't do anything until they move in. They pass the flyers, they're moving in. Oh, OK. And then once they're moved in, oh, well, we can't get them out. We've already started the process. We will continue. Yeah, we ordered if, signs. They stole our, our signs. Are all yeah. still out. If we have evidence of short-term tenancies, then uh, you, you can't do that in a, yeah. yeah we'll, we'll follow up on it thanks for the information okay yeah. thank you very much uh, last speaker is Mick O'Malley yeah what am I speaking on first time freeway, freeway uh, this says freeway construction okay freeway construction um, San Clemente resident over half century um, I've built freeways and they're very complex and lots to it there's always stops to the jobs, whether it's a woolly mammoth or an old oak tree. So, you know, they want that lane, that freeway, 32 lanes wide. I don't know why America is the stupidest country in the world and can't build a maglev high-speed train because we're idiots. Now, um, every other country in the world has one. What's wrong with us? Have we lost our work ethic? These freeways don't belong. This is AAA selling cars. You know, there's a high-speed rail, maglev, it works. It goes 650 miles an hour, and you use light rail. I don't understand what this all is about. You want to build more freeways and sell more cars? Let's build America. San Clemente, nobody got notice of this meeting. There's 30,000 people in this town. Reed's rules, you're breaking them. You didn't notify the residents. Nonsense. You guys are all criminals. Okay, that was our last speaker. Okay, can we have a motion to waive reading in full of all res... Who is that? Okay. Motion by Brown. Second, Second. by Swartz. All in favor? Aye. Passes 5-0. Before we uh, move on to the consent calendar, I have a uh, request from staff here to um, move up item 8B because we have a uh, employee here from Sacramento that would like to speak on the item. Move up which item? 8B. It's water study. Sure, yeah, I, it's fine after consent. So we'll take it up uh, before the public hearing? Yep. Okay. Everybody's good with that. Yeah. Steve, are you? Oh, yeah. Good? That's fine. Okay. Yeah, let's get the consent. Is it? Okay, so does anyone have anything to pull? No. no. Lori? Uh, 6-0. We're close. I feel like we've been close. You can't last wave three your times. arms on that, Steve. Yeah, you're the public safety guy. Yeah, you can't. Expected you to pull. 6-0. Um, oh, I, I forgot. And the public's request is 6-B-2. Oh. 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 Oh.
Yeah, I believe we have a new report on that. 62 and 60. I think 6 that's what? what? 6B2 and 60. Um, I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to pull the minutes of uh, the Planning Commission. So that would be 6B2. Oh, I'm sorry. Same one. So, Larry, I assume you're pulling that. Okay. So, is there a motion to move the balance? I'm so moved. Did you move? Okay. Motion by Swartz, second by Ham. All in favor? Aye. Passes 5 0. So, 6B2. So this is a public item. So do you want to talk about that just a little bit? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so 6B2, I believe you're specifically talking about uh, the property located at Monterey uh, Lane. This is a historic structure. And an applicant came in to do an addition to that historic home. It was reviewed by Design Review Subcommittee and ultimately supported by the Planning Commission uh, for an addition on that property. In addition, that property had a Mills Act located, or a Mills Act on it, um, that specifically requires uh, modifications to the garage, which is where the addition is occurring. Was there any addition off the back also? There was not an addition off um, the back. it was existing? Exactly. It was maintained, and what they were doing was upgrades to the existing deck because of wood rot. Uh, the, the property was in a significant disrepair. Uh, so the applicant is actually trying to decide if they're going to move forward with the project due to the cost of all the improvements at this time. Okay, well then there's my concern with it is this property for 10 years had a Mills Act on it and it had a condition to replace a roof, I believe, that was non-conforming on the garage. That's correct. And that was never done. And so I'm not sure it was ever even reviewed. And so my question would be, are we behind on those properties? I think, is it, isn't it like every two years? So the review them? Yes, so the uh, planning division did a comprehensive update just to, because we had noticed that the um, upkeep and review on the Mills Act unfortunately had not been done to um, our requirements just because of staff load. So last year we reviewed all the Mills Act, we identified which ones were not compliant, and we put ourselves on a schedule in order to review those on an annual basis. Okay, that, yeah. was, that was my request is from now on. Mm -hmm. We really need to review those. This is a different owner. Um, but that should have been done beforehand, you know, totally because agree. they were getting tax relief on that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my question on it. Um, I believe the public pulled it, so we'll go ahead and let them speak Perfect. as to why they pulled that. Good evening, Council. Larry Culbertson, resident. So I've requested the removal of this item because I'm concerned about the approval of CHP 16434, which would allow a large addition to the historic home located at 404 Monterey Lane. I hope you read the letter that I uh, sent to you on July 26 and had a chance to visit the property. Uh, the letter references two other letters that I have written to the Planning Commission detailing how the proposed project does not comply with the Secretary of Interior standards, the city guidelines, or our general plan. The issues I raised about the destruction of character-defining features and how the addition would far outmass the existing house were not mentioned or considered by the majority of the Planning Commission. Uh, here are two of the Commissioner's four discussion slash comments included on page 7 of the minutes of July 18. Uh, expressed dismay that the original building photograph uh, included in the packet for tonight's meeting was not included during the DRSC review suggested a different outcome might have resulted. Suggested the proposed revision change the character of the existing cottage style home too much without justification and for that reason all the findings could not be met. Yet despite those comments the Commission voted 5 to 2 to approve the project. Now I understand that you're very busy and you must delegate work to your commissions and committees. You cannot exhaustively review every decision that they make but I believe that, that, that they were wrong in this call, and I'm asking you to reconsider their approval. 
I also raised uh, two directly related issues in my letter to you that I hope you will consider. Uh, one is the need to have an outside, independent, historic preservation expert verify that any major alteration of a historic resource uh, complies with the rules that we've put in place to protect the integrity of those resources. No, offen no offense to our city staff or the commission. I know there are a couple of the commissioners here tonight. They're great people, trying their hardest, doing a good job. But none of them is an expert in historic, uh, historic uh, preservation expert. Uh, it is a fact that the surrounding cities, such as Laguna Beach and San Juan Capistrano, require consultant verification. The other issue is the lack of oversight of our Mills Act, Mills Act properties. About one-third of our 203 historic resources are receiving this huge property tax reduction. We do not know how many of them are not being maintained. 404 Monterey Lane, for example, has been receiving that benefit for 16 years. Uh, but according to the owner's testimony, the home is riddled with termites, dry rot, black mold, rodents, and a cracked foundation. These maintenance problems must be corrected, but not by allowing an addition that destroys the building's character. All other Mills Act buildings must be inspected to ensure that they are not suffering a similar fate. Thank you. Amber, I just have a quick question, because we have to decide whether to call this up, you know, for review on the council since it was pulled. When a house, I'm assuming this uh, complies with the non-conforming ordinance as far as how much, how many square feet that they added on to, because I think the original was high eights or nine. Yes, all the um, development standards were looked at as part of this review as well. Okay. When we allow a small cottage like that to um, expand, we don't change the parking requirements because this is going from a single family one car garage to another one car garage. We don't. Actually, a, a property is not considered non conforming based on parking alone. And that's because most of your historic structures were developed at a time when there was no parking ordinance in place at the time. And our non conforming ordinance specifically says that a single car garage does not make a home non conforming. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we're adding a lot of square footage that would add possibly more occupants to what the cottage was before. So we don't consider parking at all. We do not require a two-car garage be provided in that situation, no. Is the garage in this making the driveway any shorter? Do you know? Does the existing garage sit back more than the new garage would? I believe the new garage sits back actually further. The nonconformity has to do with the side yard setback, not the garage. Okay. So I'm just a... I was afraid of how much square footage was added. Do, do you want to call this up? No, I don't want to call it up. I was afraid at first how much square footage was added, but I think the reason the <coughs> DRSC went with it is because it's a separate uh, structure kind of attached to the end of it and it could be taken off and the cottage would still be there. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe that's why it was done. But I do want to make sure because I don't recall seeing any of the uh, culture heritage permits coming back. So that was mainly my issue is that okay. this went all those years without uh, any compliance. And so I am concerned about all the other ones um, that we really need to stay up on those. Yes, so, and we are taking steps to correct that. And I okay. wholeheartedly agree with you. Okay, so I won't call it up for that. I am concerned about the parking, and this council is going to have to take that up sometime when we add additions, whether they're historic or not. Okay. We do need to take that up. I have a question of staff. Larry brought up a good point. Do those other cities, in fact, do uh, third-party consultants? Some do. Some don't. Um, are you aware of how they do it? Is that something that's paid for by the applicant, or is that something that costs it? I think we would have to do a survey on how different cities handle that. That does bring an interesting perspective. You know, one of the biggest issues I've had with this is I feel like every time there's an addition proposed, Larry has an issue with it. And w well, not every time, a lot of times. And <laughs> you know, it comes down to it. Well, yeah, except like he doesn't impose those. There's, it seems there's a level of subjectiveness to this. So what Larry sees as uh, egregious or a uh, large addition I see as a standard normal size mm -hmm. addition. So it would be interesting to have a third party perspective on these moving forward, especially if it's a cost recuperative program where uh, the applicant who's going to be gaining this amazing tax incentive pays for the cost of that. 
So is there any way that we can request staff to give us a report on um, whether or not other cities are doing a third party and how they're paying for it? I think that's a good idea. And do I need to recuse myself at this point because um, our home has Mills oh. Act and this is a policy discussion rather than an individual right. property yeah. discussion? Uh, well, I, I think that just the request for information is fine. It wouldn't respect to, it wouldn't apply to a specific property. And then, yeah, when it goes to coming back for direction on the policy. I think okay. that's an excellent suggestion. So, staff clear with that recommendation, James and Amber? Yes. Okay. okay. So All not right. only the, whether or not they use them, but if they do use them, is it a cost recovery program or is it something that the community bears the cost? Great. Thank you. Okay, so I also pulled that item, so I'll move 6B2. Second. Motion by Ward, second by Ham. All in favor? Aye. Passes 5-0. I'm sorry, did we move the balance? Yes, we did. All except for two items. Okay. Yeah, we did. Uh, next item is 6 all right, uh, I pulled this in. Um, I have a couple of questions on it. This is the Orange County Sheriff's Department Law Enforcement Cost and Efficiency Study being spearheaded by Mission Viejo. And um, so my first question, looking at who signs the MOU that we're contemplating today, is who from the city will be our representative? It looks like you're not looking for either Chris or Steve to be our vote. So who's it going to be? So. Uh, in terms of serving on this committee, it would either be the city manager as the primary or myself as the assistant city manager. So okay. No that is correct. Yeah. No and, no and so I'd like to hear your feeling about um, the value of this. I, okay, just uh, for those in the audience, every city in District 5 is being asked to participate in this except L Laguna Beach, which has its own standalone police department. And then in addition, Stanton, Villa Park, and Yorba Linda. And so 13 cities are being asked to uh, cost share a study that would look at um, ways to save money with OCSD. So I'm curious, in the, um, on the heels of the matrix study, how our senior staff feels about this. The, the city managers for the South Orange County area, uh, who all have contract police services with OCSD, have been talking about this for a number of months, doing this efficiency study, seeing where exactly uh, the costs are going up, where they're being allocated, so forth and so on. You know, we've had contract increases of 5.85%, 9%, 8.9%, uh, three out of the past four years here in San Clemente. Other cities have seen other large uh, increases of the same magnitude. Uh, we're really concerned about these increases and how they're going to affect our budgets in the future because our revenues aren't increasing. Uh, at the same rate that their uh, cost of service is going up. So we've all banded together uh, as a group. We decided an efficiency study was a good first step before having a conversation with the sheriff, uh, Sandra Hutchins, uh, to get a better understanding of where uh, our money is going for the, all the South County cities. We also called in Stanton, uh, Villa Park, and Yorba Linda because they're also contract cities uh, for the Sheriff's Department and invited them to participate. Um, so we've already had a number of cities agendize it and approve it. Uh, other cities are approving it or have it agendized tonight and I think the rest are agendizing it next week uh, to consider it. Okay, and, and my next question is, um, would this city council has a bias towards studies that have action and so is it expected that this would be done in time to affect our next budget cycle or what's the time horizon for which we'd get a result potentially? What's your thoughts I on think, that? I think that's a goal, but I think one of the things that they first have to do is once all the cities opt in and then Mission Vieja would lead the uh, process of conducting the request for proposal, coming back with an evaluation committee, I think it won't be something that we will be able to bring forward in the next fiscal year. It'll probably be something we bring back after the beginning of the next fiscal year. So maybe late summer, early fall of 18. We get our first estimate from OCSD at the end of January, 1st of February. So it'll be pretty difficult to get the study rolling and get that uh, for this fiscal that follow up year. done for this fiscal year. Okay. So as Eric said, it'll probably be the following fiscal year. 
James, um, I, I know we're not the only city, but we also just recently completed our own analysis. Are they going to be integrating some of the results of some of these previous studies as part of this? I mean, I, I, it's not obviously the cost is what the cost is, but... There's, there's been a few other cities besides uh, San Clemente that have used Matrix. Um, and because of that, we've chosen as a group of city managers that we weren't going to look towards Matrix to uh, follow up on this study, that we were going to go in a different uh, direction with another consultant, someone with another fresh set of eyes. Um, ours wasn't really about a cost of delivery. It was more about you know, what we're getting in value for, you know, police service, where were we at uh, in the quality of police service. So this is more about the dollars and cents and how they're allocating that money. Are we going to, in this, while this is going on, what about we've kind of kicked around the concepts of a JPA uh, and, and, and adding in our, or bringing in our own or looking at alternatives? Is this, is this group going to be also looking at alternatives? I think this is a first step. You know, city managers have all discussed uh, that concept. Uh, we've looked at a, another group of cities out in Riverside County that, that are contemplating it. Uh, but as a group of city managers, uh, we decided this was the best way to go in the beginning before dropping that uh, sort of action on the sheriff's department. Um, the sheriff is aware that we've had that discussion. Uh, but we thought this was the best best direction to go right now. Well, I will move the item uh, <coughs> because if there are ways to um, item eight is can efficiencies be found by consolidating accounting, purchasing human resources um, between the OCSD and county. I'm glad that you're looking beyond the cities and beyond OCSD, but their relationship with the county um, supervisors as well as um, where the leverage is. Uh, but I really encourage you to take a message back to your group that um, we really want some action out of this. Um, it's, it's very Im important to understand what's driving the cost, but action. And if it is an authority that we set up by ourselves or if it's regional subgroups uh, um, that are geographically contingent, um, be far-reaching in this process. Uh, before you move on, I have a couple questions. So the first one is it says that uh, Mission Viejo is going to take the lead on this. What exactly, what's the definition of the lead? Does that mean they're going to run the organization or just give them our cash? No. Well, so yes, once after tonight's approval, if the council approves it, you're authorizing the city to execute the MOU signed by the city manager. And then also uh, it indicates the fiscal impact of about $30,000. That money will be given to Mission Viejo. Mission Viejo will keep the money and then actually do the RFP for this scope okay. and then it'll come back to a city manager evaluation committee to you know determine who's going to win the rfp and then move forward and then again once there is a contract led it'll be let by mission viejo to the company the consultant company that does the study and then again working with the city manager working group on you know authorizing release of payment etc so this isn't going to be focusing primarily on Mission Viejo, it's going to be a county-wide survey. We just needed one person to carry the, And they're the, the largest of the participants yeah. on a population basis. Got it. And is there going to be anything binding us to the recommendations that come out of this study? One of the biggest issues I have moving forward with this item is, uh, I think it was just last budget cycle, the budget cycle before, the, uh, what they call the South Orange County Operations Center, or whatever, that they were trying to charge us for. And I could very easily see Lake Forest Mission Viejo getting back on that bag line and go, hey, why aren't you guys paying your fair share of this operation center that we have no use for and we don't use in any way, shape, or form? So I just want to confirm that we're not tied to whatever they're doing. Well, I think, you know, one thing the sheriff has said to us, be careful what you ask for, mm -hmm. you know, because you might find costs that uh, we didn't really necessarily know uh, how to charge or we're charging correctly. So you might end up with charges that you didn't see before. So that's been a comment from Sheriff's Command staff. Uh, I, my other concern with this, and I don't know enough about the Sheriff's Department, but um, being that we're probably the only contract city that had our own police force before going to the Sheriff's contract, we have the ability at any time to create our own police force. I don't know if that exists for no, I think, other I think any city has the ability to create its own police force. Just does that city have the ability to pay for it? You know, it, it, in most 
uh, cities that have a standalone police force, it's a huge part of the budget. Uh, you know, sometimes 50 to 60 percent of the general fund budget is going just towards uh, the police uh, force. I think right now in San Clemente, we're paying about 40 percent of our general fund budget towards public safety in general. So, you know, it's, it's a much more cost effective model of delivering police services. Okay. And then before I move this, it's, is it wise to ask for updates to come to council or to the public safety task force on uh, progress on this? Because I, I, I'm curious how you're going to decide how to vote. Is it going to be because we're the fourth largest city in the mix, we get uh, our vote is weighted differently than a Villa Park, for example. Um, and I'm also interested where you land in terms of um, top issues. Well, we can come back to the council once we get to that point. Um, I think the city managers have okay. have been pretty uh, equitable as far as you know the number of cities. What we all have an equal say in it. I mean, I, I understand that we're all paying a different rate based on our population as a matter of fairness. But I think we're looking uh, for the best way to provide police services to our residents through our contracts. Uh, to each city and make sure that it's equitable in how the cities are paying for their police services. Okay, I'm, I might have missed it because I'm a politician. I like to hear myself talk. But just to be clear, we are not bound by any of the recommendations. I don't believe so. No. Okay, that, that's a pretty big caveat for me. So, well, it, I would believe they can't execute anything for us. So, anything's going to be we're going to have to approve if we go into any agreement. The, this the is just the this only is reason just I, establishing this. Yeah, the only reason I asked that question, I want to be very clear, is because uh, all we have before me is a very well written staff report and a scope. Yeah. We don't have the MOU sitting before us. And so, so, the MOU's in there. so the I'll play out on that. Yeah, the MOU's there. Oh, Council Member yeah. Ham, to, I'll but play out my desk. a scenario. Let's say that the study comes back and says they're running two accounts payable divisions, and that should be consolidated into one division. And, uh, you know, provide that service more cost effective and not have two groups. That would be a recommendation. When we come forward to the city council with those recommendations, the city council could at that point say, we don't support that decision. Um, but again, we're talking 13 cities. So you know, other cities could say, yeah, we do support that because it'll lower our price tag from a contract services standpoint. So, so Eric, this is the scope of this is, you know, when we looked at the delivered police service, it was extremely localized. They weren't looking north at all to any of the general services. The scope of this agreement is much wider. Correct. It's looking at all, all the yeah, so yeah. unincorporated all areas that OCESD yeah. provides patrol and enforcement. I mean, it's everything. An, it's an intriguing thing because um, this is, you know, we are highly reliant on the sheriff's department for the services, but also an understanding of those services. Correct. And um, and then ultimately the accountability on whether or not it's being done correctly and cost effectively is. Uh, you know, really up. I mean, we don't, we've never taken that question on as a council, and so it just kind of happens under the county board of supervisors and they're <laughs> under their purview. And so it would be interesting to ask the question is, is the service delivery efficient? We know we get, we know we have wonderful local police staff here, but Correct. ultimately, what's happening elsewhere that we have to pay for? Yeah. And that, that is an interesting question to me. So, you know, if uh, you know, it's a study. So ultimately, there'll be recommendations, and then I'm assuming we have at that point the ability to be able to act on recommendations. That's correct. Either collaboratively with the other cities or individually. Correct. Yes. And how does uh, has the sheriff's department commented on this at all, or have we received <coughs> feedback from them on this study? Yeah, we've we've met with the sheriff. Um, I belong to a five-member technical advisor advisory committee of city managers. We've met with the sheriff and her command staff, and she understands our desire to do this. I think she's supportive of it. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see where the results go. OK, um, I'll move item O to approve. Motion by Donchek, second by Brown. All in favor? Aye. Passes 5-0. And I'd like to thank the city managers for oh, well, taking the initiative to do that because I know we met with the sheriff asking for that 
and uh, as mayors, and I think the city managers figured out that the only way we'd get the information was to do it on our own. So I do appreciate you doing that. Okay, Joanne, we're going to take up uh, item 8B first. Okay. And that is a report from the assistant city manager concerning the water utility cost of service fee structure. So anyone that's in the uh, audience that came to speak about 8B, we're moving that up uh, now, and it's on the water rates. Just wanted to announce that before we start. Good evening. It's Eric Sund, Assistant City Manager. So a long time coming. Uh, as you know, we've come to the council a number of times over the last year and communicated the, the want to do a cost of service study for our water rates as well as coming back to the council talking about different water rate structures. So just to kind of refresh the council's memory, we're currently in a three-tier water rate system. Um, and then one thing that's very important for this whole discussion is the drought that the state mandated. So water usage has changed dramatically in the state of California since the drought. So people are using less water. So that's a really good win. However, there's a, there's a downside to that, and that's that the infrastructure that still continues to supply that water is in place, and there needs to be cost to obviously capture that. And so tonight we have a couple of things before you. We have a draft water rate study for council's review as well as the public review. We'll have a presentation by Pierce Rawson from Carollo uh, that did the actual cost of service study to go over the results. But at the end of the day, we're making a recommendation to the council to go to a uniform water rate structure which would mean a water rate, a uniform water rate for each of our four classes, single family resident, multifamily, commercial and irrigation. And so in Pierce's presentation, he'll go over the cost implications that it has with regards to the cost of service study. But one thing I think that was important to kind of give the council as we go through this process is to get, provide a 10 year history of our water rate increases that the city of San Clemente has seen over time. So you can see as back in 2009, we actually had a 15.7% increase and we've seen 12s. They've dropped down to sevens <laughs> and 6% and then back up to 12% and then obviously going forward. One of the things that we did as p the goal of the water rate study was to examine current costs before us. And so one thing I want to really stress to the council is, you know, utilities has projects that they have to do in order to maintain the infrastructure and there's a cost to those projects. We, as we go through the results of the cost of service study, have realized that, you know, we weren't charging the appropriate amounts of dollars. One of the things that's really important for public perception is we're not adding more utility staff, we're not, we're not buying outrageous toys, we're not doing anything. It's business as usual for the city of San Clemente, and it will continue to be business as usual. And so one of the things that I know that residents will be dealing with as these rates go into play, if the council is uh, going to approve this, is there, there will be increases to the residents, but one of the things that we'll see in the presentation is we've isolated the fixed cost versus the variable cost. So a good example is a majority of our water we buy from Metropolitan Water. Whatever they charge us will be passed directly onto the customer. It's, so if their increase goes up, that cost goes right to the end user. There's no markup. It's just that's what the cost is. And we'll go into more detail on that as we go through. It's also important for council to realize we're going to have multiple presentations and hearings before you. So this is not just a one shot tonight and then we put the rates into effect. We're going to be doing 218 noticing. We're going to be doing another public hearing. A number of steps before the council, there'll have to be an adoption of, a, of an ordinance to adopt the new water fees. And between now and once the water rates go into effect in January, one of the things that I know is important to the city council is public education and communication, but also keeping it simple and making it easy for the end user to understand why they're seeing these increases. Because, you know, as you get into this cost of service study, it's very difficult sometimes to get your arms around all of the nuances of the report. But for the end user, it's always about my water bill. How much is it going to be and why did it go up? And so we're very sensitive to that and we're going to be working on some really good marketing messaging points to keep it simple for the public to understand. But the gist of it is, again, water 
drought has created a new environment in the state of California and we have to adapt. So again, we have people using less water, which is a great win, but we have infrastructure, we have pump systems, we have a number of things that we've got to continue to maintain. And one of the things if you're uh, in tune with what the state of California is dealing with is, you know, the infrastructure within the state of California, the estimate is somewhere upwards of $23 billion in aging infrastructure for our water. And so that's something that many cities and water districts are going to be faced with over the coming years is maintaining that infrastructure to the standards of what you know we expect in terms of clean water being delivered to our house and so with that I stand down we have a team both myself David Rebensdorf and Tom Rendiner who are here to answer questions but I'm going to give it to Pierce we've also brought Kimberly Hood from Sacramento the BBK office where is she there she is who specializes in water so she's been walking in our shadows that we as we've been going through this water study so she's been keeping us on the right path as to what is the appropriate technique and formulas to go with so with that I'm going to stop I'm going to turn it over to Pierce and this will be an interactive process uh, one thing I will also point out very simply, where's my dollar go? And so this was a very simple, and it's still in a work in progress, but if you have a dollar, where does it go? So 36 cents would go to purchase water costs, 11 cents to water production, operating costs, 31 cents, infrastructure maintenance and improvement, 17 cents, and debt service, 5 cents. So that's a very simple message of what that dollar does for that. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Pierce. Thank you. So only 36 cents out of a dollar is actual water. Yes. Thank you. No, uh, that's 36 cents plus we're producing water at 11 cents. So it's a total of 47 cents out of a dollar is water cost. No, the actual water. Yeah, 46. Okay. Good evening. Uh, again, my name is Pierce Rossum. I'm with Corolla Engineers. Uh, Eric did a good job of, of teeing it up for me. So just a quick presentation on a number of the slides you've seen before as we've been here uh, a couple times throughout almost this year-long process. I uh, just want to start with kind of the project overview. Uh, last time we were in front of you was June 6th, and we had a, a number of uh, items that were addressed. And so part of the previous recommendations were to increase the fixed cost recovery. So that's moving away from being so reliant on variable revenues, so water usage, and more reliant on uh, our, our fixed costs, our monthly fees. And as that kind of dollar breakout showed, you know, yes, 36 cents is for the cost of actually purchasing water. We have the remaining cost to get it to you, and that's where a lot of the, the cost is. Um, and so this rate structure will better reflect how your costs are incurred. Implemented the water pass-through, so we're taking that away from uh, our crystal ball. We're not trying to assume what those increases are. We're not going to be wrong or we're not going to be right. We're just going to say, hey, if the cost comes in as a 5% increase for MODOC, then we pass that directly on. If we end up doing different sources supplies because cheaper, better alternatives come available, then that cost can also be wrapped up in the purchase uh, the water pass through. So doing that. Uh, demand management rates. So easiest way to consider these is drought rates. Uh, just another lever, another tool in the, the belt, if you would, for us um, to make sure we continue to have uh, better cost recovery. Establishment of a five-year rate, rate program. We're not trying to do this all in year one. We're trying to do this over the next five years to make sure we, we get uh, to the steady foundation where we need. And then we also approved uh, preliminarily uniform rates for multifamily commercial irrigation potable as well as uh, irrigation non-potable. <coughs> so those were what we visited in June 6th. There was one outstanding question. And so that was to come back and give another presentation on which way do we go? Do we go two tiers or do we go a uniform route for single family residents? Uh, so as Eric mentioned, currently we have three tiers uh, because of how demands have really changed. Uh, it's a perfect time to revisit this. So as I said, falling water demands significantly impacts the city's ability to recover uh, costs. 
If we take a look at the 10-year historical usage, we're down 26% from historical, 14% from our lowest low. So this is quite a new normal that we're in. Uh, if we also take a look at the existing tiered structure, we were generating significantly more revenue than we were three years ago than we are today. And part of that is with the, the tier design. When we have a $10 tier three, it doesn't take a whole lot of consumption in tier three to generate a lot of revenue. But when that revenue gets cut back because of the great conservation, we lose, we go from 1.2 million down to 500,000. And so, you know, just in a single year, 800,000, that's almost three, four percent of the total budget of the water utility. That's a big number to drop off without a real corresponding decrease in your costs. So that's kind of sets the stage of what's been happening in terms of demands. Wanted to take a, a deeper dive into individual customers and how they use water. So we have a class here of how does single family throughout the year use water? January through December, typical year, we see that we spike in the summer months. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, so between the mid month and the max month, customers, single family uses 52% more water. Multifamily, because they have less irrigation need, only uses 23% peak in June. Um, commercial, somewhere in between the two, uh, maybe slightly more irrigable needs. And then on a completely different scale, so this is moving to the right axis, um, we have a 526% peak for yeah, irrigation. And so what we wanted to do is just say, look, people use the system differently. And if it wasn't for how people use the system differently, we could size the system and we could have a uniform rate for all classes. But the fact is people use water differently. It's not the cost of water that's different. It's the cost of delivering that water that's different. And so the size of our infrastructure, the size of our reservoirs, the size of our storage tanks, all of those have to be sized to meet a 5.2 times peak. They're not using any water in the winter. They're using a heck of a lot in summer. And so that costs us to maintain the system, that costs us to replace the system, that costs us to design. So when we talk about tiered versus uniform for single family, the question is really, do we try to s delineate those two costs, base and peak? Um, and we can do this for single family because they're a homogeneous group. For the most part, everyone's using roughly the same amount of water uh, versus commercial. You've got a 7-Eleven and a Costco and the outlets, all very different water usage. Under your uniform approach, everything isn't delineated. It's all blended together. And so we're not trying to say peak costs or conservation costs are only applied to tier two. We just say that customer class pays for their peak um, in, in aggregate. Between the two options, there's a, a minimal impact. So if we take a look at the uniform alternative, a typical customer using nine CCF a month would be $55.79 under a two tier option because you'd be getting less expensive cost of delivery of water uh, in tier one versus tier two. The $9 break point would be $53.45. Uh, and that's versus an existing of $43.22. So at the end of the day, the increase, the other adjustments that we're doing in terms of fixed cost recovery are the primary uh, change here. The difference in rate structure is, is marginal. And so based on everything in terms of the overall recommendation, uh, it's to go for a uniform rate structure for each class. Uh, part of that is just to keep everything in terms of the objective of simplification um, and the increased revenue stability. As I showed the tier three graphic, we have a lot of revenue stability with tiers. So by going uniform, uh, the hope is that eliminates most of that risk. Uh, so single family, for example, rather than 286, 468, and $10.06, each cost of each unit of water would be $4.12. Uh, 
um, and that four dollars and twelve cents could change uh, with the pass through so I just wanted to make that clear just to confirm the 412 is an aggregate of the our fixed base plus our the fluctuation fluctuating cost of, of water so our fixed base is going to stay the same yes and it's just a matter of the fluctuating cost based upon our, our cost of water that we get from Metropolitan Water District right exactly and and so just to make sure we identify and, and clarify any confusion there um, the proposition 218 notice will clearly spell out the components of each so you know what is fixed in terms of what you are approving of in terms of that component of the 412 versus the pass-through cost that could change um, so just wanted to wrap up with next steps so following tonight's input will be again coming back on the 19th so in two weeks to present uh, the final cost of service study and look for the council to uh, recommend uh, approval of the 218 notice that would be sent out two days later um, to all property owners uh, within the service area november 7th would be the public hearing uh, where we'd come back to look for actual uh, uh, approval of the rates and then uh, January 1st the rates would take effect and as Eric mentioned there's going to be a lot more outreach and meetings and and whatnot just to make sure everyone has their their answers thank you does anyone have any questions no? okay we do have one card Brad Malamu. You, you say that. I do. Listen, there's a lot, a lot that was covered. I'll try to be short, but you know, this was a good step forward. I would ask you to go to uniform rates, and I'd ask you to go to uniform rates for all users. This is such a pile of hooey. One of the statements made in here was that single families are homogeneous groups. No, they're not. We all use water very differently in this town. Some of us have artificial lawns. Some of us don't use more in summer. Some of us use less, but we group them together to charge them more money than other groups. Why would that be right? Could anybody, does anybody, I think council should try common sense. This is a thing they do very well all the time. In fact, it was interesting, just a minute ago, I like tying the meetings together. Um, somebody at the council made a very brilliant comment, I think, uh, what cost studies have we done to try to figure out what's going on for the sheriffs? Not one penny of this has been a cost study. Where can we save money for our citizens? Why wasn't that part of this? So I think the same logic should be used on these costs that the citizens are paying as what the city's paying. I think it was Tim. I think it, was a, it was a great comment. Anyway, uniform rates, peak demand. If you read this carefully, it says peak demand is morning and night use. And then we get the sleight of hand. It's now monthly use. And because single family residents put together as a group use more water than commercial, they should pay more for water. Does that make sense to anybody in this room where a commercial could be right next to a residence using the same pipes, the same water, and maybe this commercial is using water all the time they're a plastic manufacturer or something and so they're using water 24 hours a day huge demand but the house next door is paying more for water on a per gallon basis that makes no sense I think we're close though and I think looking at these charts we could get to a single rate for for all potable water users and it's going to be what it costs and isn't that what the law requires? Mr. Smith will tell you it is. It's got to be the cost of the water. This amorphous concept that because people use water more, the single family homogeneous group, they should pay more for water than a multifamily resident, that makes no sense. Some may have lush, big backyards. Some may not have any. So that isn't the way you do it. That isn't the way the law demands it be done. You guys can actually be progressive. And also, one other thing, there seems to be some I don't know, predetermined thing that less water use is better, which drives up rates. The more water people use, it drives rates down. Um, it's so kind of odd here that we want, when we have plenty of water for the next few years, that we should tell people, save water. No, we should be using it now. People should be glow growing lush things. They should be filling their pools because the actual water rates will come down. Um, because obviously the fixed costs are spread over more water use. So only 36% cost for that next gallon of water. Why will we tell people when we have plenty of water, when our reservoirs are full, don't use water? Um, everybody's got to be educated. At times of drought, yeah, let's cut back, but the price is going to go up. 
So I think you really need to look at this. Go to uniform rates for everybody. Um, make a single rate structure for all non-commercial use. And I think it's going to be $4 and something. Um, this gentleman's more than capable of figuring that out. And do a study and find out why is our water so expensive here. Thank you so much. Mr. Rosnan, do you want to try to answer? I wrote some of them down. First of all, was there a cost study done? We did not audit the, the cost of the budget, so in that respect, no. Uh, we but took our cost numbers. We, we took your cost, your, your budget numbers. Uh, okay. We did a cost of service study on them in terms of how are the costs being incurred. Uh, whether we said, is this an appropriate salary for this individual, or is this appropriate? Uh, no, we did not. But the cost of pipes and pumps and all of that is, that's pretty uniform, isn't it? I mean, our city, we make sure that we aren't overpaying on things, and we budget for that. So you relied on those. Yes, and, and I think one thing that has been uh, suggested for future uh, presentations is for a cost survey of, of neighboring agencies. Just, is our cost of water significantly more than others? And, you know, explain the, the, the reasons for that. Most of South Orange County has the same source of supply. Uh, some have some groundwater access, others do not. Uh, but you can kind of look at, no, we're, we're right in the ballpark, and I think if we kind of looked at 9 CCF, you'd see that you're on the, the lower end of that uh, survey. Okay, and on the peak time, what did you state the peak time was? I thought I thought you said it was summer. So there, there's it, we we mentioned in the report that there are two different types of peak. There is diurnal peak, so within the day, how water use is being consumed. Just like our power curves, you have have water curves that say you know people wake up, take a shower, leave for the day, come back, cook. Um, there's a, a diurnal curve to that. We don't have that level of information. We don't have AMI. Uh, and so the best, most granular level of data available is monthly billing. And we can use that to say base versus peak capacity. Um, and the big thing is, at the end of the day, we've got to size the system to meet peak summer demands. And so that's how the system's designed. That's how we dis determine our reservoirs and, and all the rest. And so, yes, diurnal curve is an impact of that, but from a cost of service study, the most granular we can get on a reasonable basis is uh, looking at the monthly data. Do you have a question? Yeah, well, I'd just like to put it into um, residential speak a little bit. From what I understand, uh, basically, uh, we're passing through exactly to everybody the exact same what our, what our water costs as far as what the product itself. Mm -hmm. We're buying most of it from Metropolitan. We pump some here, whatever it is, we're passing that number on to, 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 to the users in, in, in San Clemente. The differential that we have on the, the, the differential of the users between like sam a single family residence and a multifamily residence, first of all, we're talking a difference of 13 cents mm -hmm. per unit. 13 cents. Yes. Okay. So it's 399 to 412. Uh, and the reason that we're looking at that is because of delivering the water, it takes more equipment because the usage is higher. So we're looking at what the cost is as far as the size of the piping, the sizes, sizes of our pumping or everything else. Mm -hmm. And then we back that into what the demand is. So someone that is demanding twice as much, let's say a plastics factory next to your house, if they're demanding twice as much, you know, so they're using that much more infrastructure, so we would slip them into the a rate that we've accommodated that as far as a larger cost of the equipment goes. It's, yes, uh, and, and just in terms of of the example, really what we're trying to get at is if, say, irrigation, because that's the, the most significant difference here, is if we could get away with only three pumps in the city uh, because no one had above a 0.55 peak, then 
we could have three pumps. But because we have someone who's, you know, a four times peak, well, all of a sudden the demand curve is very different, and we have to build the infrastructure to support that. Yeah, and so it's it's the use of the greater expanded system. Yeah, we have to do, we have to build the largest system that would service the largest demand. Yes. So that we don't have somebody on one end of the water open up their you know turn on the pipe and nothing comes out. So that's basically what we have to do. I exactly, and, and we've just experienced it with this heat wave. You know, why can't we just have more power? Well, we can, but you'd have to produce greater capacity in the system. And that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to allocate the capacity of how it's been designed to use. And so we, you know, rarely run into that situation where we don't, you turn on the tap and nothing comes out. We've got the capacity, we've built the infrastructure, and now we're just making sure that the appropriate parties pay for it. Uh, lastly, the comment was made, uh, we should have a single rate structure for non-commercial use. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if we had a, a single blended rate for all customers, everyone would go up except for irrigation. And, okay. you know, in terms of the common sense question, does that make sense? If someone's peaking five times on the system, is it fair that they're not paying for that extra capacity? If we have extra pumps, extra larger pipes, larger reservoirs to serve that demand, we want to make sure that peak pays for peak. And so, you know, it might be a de minimis difference for multifamily versus commercial, single family and commercial, um, but we want to make sure that certainly that does exist for uh, irrigation. And I think the other, one other question was, uh, or comment was the homogeneous group for single family. Right, if we take a look at usage and we plot a bell curve, uh, we see that it's a very tight bell curve and versus if we plot that same histogram for commercial, there's no consistent pattern, there's no bell, it's just flat. And so, you know, running statistics, running that sort of analysis, we've looked at the homogeneous <laughs> nature of, of single family. Yes, there are going to be people on, that are outliers, uh, but we're well within kind of a, a normal deviation. Okay. I don't have any more questions. Okay. Great. Thank you. I only have a, a question for city manager and... Um, Assistant City Manager. So, one of my first um, times we ever voted to raise water rates, um, I think it was actually it was in the second or third year council. I can't remember when it was, but one of the things that was very compelling about that is that there was an internal review done where they went through and identified every possible efficiency they could capture uh, in the unit in the water delivery unit. I think there was a vacant position that they kept vacant. I think that. They would analyze all sorts of whatever could be analyzed and, 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 and audited was. And before they went to the public with a cost increase, made sure that everything was being done internally that, um, to ensure that we weren't, you know, we weren't running, um, that we were running lean, right? And so in anticipation of this, um, you know, I, the idea of going out to a cost study maybe at this point, uh, it may be useful to audit and see how we perform. Like one of the things I love about our golf course, for example, is that we have always heard from people who've analyzed the golf course operations about how we run a really great course uh, without a very heavy, you know, load, right? It, it's not a lot of people. We do it efficiently. It's a great delivery of service. That feels good every time I hear that, you know, I, I, I know that. And so I like, and I know we've had this conversation before and I know we haven't added people and, and I know these things because I've been tracking like you know staffing and all these different things but I don't know how well the public knows these things and so whatever we do with these water rates should be done in tandem with an internal review to ensure that we are truly running an efficient lean shop and we do it all over the city of San Clemente so uh, again this isn't anything that we're not already doing but the public should know that we are reviewing and ensuring that um, every possible step we can take uh, in reducing costs for the end customer we're taking those and that we're not, you know, like you said, like in, in your presentation, you said that we're not, um, um, that we're not. Um, 
Adding. A adding, right, positions and, and doing things like that. So I, I'd really like that to be a part, maybe running in tandem with this cost increase. So before we uh, go with a water rate increase to the public, at the same time we could tell folks, listen, we've done this internally. We've lowered costs this much. Here's efficiency we've had and perhaps present both at the same time so that the, the, we can all benefit from that conversation as well. Absolutely. It's a good idea. Doesn't each department already do that? Don't we ask that of them every single time we go to our LTFP and our, our long-range planning and our budget? So, so the answer is yes. Whenever we have a position open, we sit back down with everybody that's involved as a stakeholder and says, is this the right position? Is Can you do it for cheaper with something else? Can can we you know, have a lesser position and supplement with contractual services or whatever the case may be to see if we can do it better? That commitment has been something that San Clemente has been true to for many, many years and will continue to be that way. Um, I know to Council Member uh, Brown's point, there was a study done, I want to say between three to four years ago, that looked at organizational effectiveness and other types of things. But I think it's completely reasonable, especially from a transparency standpoint for the community and the public, to know that we're doing things cost effectively. And one thing that we've stressed before in both the budget and the long term financial plan is our, our dilemma of retaining utility employees because we don't pay the Irvine Ranch water district rates or the special district rates that they can afford because they can pay more and they, and to your point, Council Member Brown, they turn the rates up to help accommodate that. We have always taken a position of our staffing to be in the middle, to be in the median with pay, not too high, not too low. And we've struggled with our utilities division with that because people come here, they learn two to three years later, they springboard to an Irvine Ranch Water District. And so we're very, very cognizant of that and we'll continue to maintain and monitor that. But yes, we can look at the report and look at efficiencies. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like a motion? Yes. Okay. Um, I move that we approve staff recommendation, which is number one, approve the uniform rate structure for the single family residential customer classification. Two, authorize completion of the cost of service study. Three, direct staff to prepare the position 218 notice for a future public hearing regarding the proposed water rate structure changes. And then four, per the conversation, um, kicked off by uh, Council Member Brown, uh, make sure that we make every effort to educate the uh, community on what we're doing in a user-friendly way. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Council Member Doncic, second by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Brown. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Passes 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, closed session report, City Attorney. Nope, we're going to a public hearing. Oh. We didn't we do five yet. Is that okay? Hold on a second. Where are you? The closed session, re session report. City yes, you, I'm sorry. Skipped it from Thanks. I thought we were skipping way to the end, and I'm like, oh, oh we aren't there I'm yet. I'm good either way. Uh, Mayor and Council, there was no reportable action taken in closed session, but we did want to announce that Councilmember Ham recused himself in the discussion of the Emergency Services Co Coalition case. Uh, his wife has clientele that own properties in um, part of the zone affected. And might as well announce now, uh, when you get to item 8B, uh, which is consideration of that overlay, uh, he'll recuse himself from participation. 7B, uh, he'll recuse himself from participation for the same reason. Okay. The public hearing process includes a staff presentation, a presentation by the applicant not to exceed 10 minutes, and public testimony not to exceed three minutes per speaker. Following closure of the public hearing, the City Council will respond to questions raised during the hearing, discuss the issues, and act upon the matter by motion. The first public hearing relates to the 2016-2017 Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report, CAPER, for submittal to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Good evening, City Council members, Amber Gregg, City Planner. This is a review on how um, uh, CDBG funds from HUD have been spent for the last year, and it's just a summary. And staff is available to answer any questions that you have. No questions, do we have any cards? We do not. Okay, no cards? I'm gonna open and close the public hearing. Uh, I'll open the public hearing. Seeing no one speak, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Right. Move that we approve and adopt the uh, 2016-17 Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Caper for submittal to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. 
And I'll second that and thanks staff for their great stewardship of this program. Thank you. It was a great report. Oh, good. Thank you. So, motion by Ham, second by Don Check. All in favor? Aye. Passes 5 0. Great. Thank you. Next is public hearing to consider the draft housing element for the 2013 2021 state planning period as required by state law and amendments to the emergency shelter overlay that include but are not limited to separation between shelters operated by the same provider, parking, shelter operator, and submission or uh, separation between shelters operated by the same provider, parking, shelter operator, and submission of emergency and management plans. Uh, good evening. Again, I'll be covering this item as well. So this is the housing element update from 2013 and 2000 uh, to 21. The last time the city uh, adopted a housing element was actually back in 2011. So um, the city has been, first we tried to do a streamline review uh, to get adopted in 2013. Unfortunately, we were not able to do that. So we've been working on this housing element since 2014. So um, after we adopt this one, a required midterm update is also so um, required to be submitted by the state so that will be coming to you in the future um, the Planning Commission did recommend approval of this item at their last meeting um, and that was on August 16th and they did have one recommendation of uh, changing that and we'll go ahead and go over that in just a second but um, know that the last time that the City Council saw this item was actually in February of 2016 where you authorized staff to submit and staff has diligently been working with HCD since then and have submitted revisions on four separate occasions in HCD in order to try to get this um, to the point where they can be approved. Luckily, on July 24th, we did receive a letter from HCD with a conditional certification. And in that letter, they outlined uh, specific items that needed to be adhered to in order for it to comply with state uh, requirements. The most important is number five here on that list, and that's modifying um, our emergency shelter overlay zone. And those are the second part of the report before you tonight to um, initiate adoption of those amendments as well. So the proposed re revisions of the emergency shelter overlay include removal of a 300 foot separation requirement for the same emergency shelter operator. That is not for all shelters, but again, just the same shelter operator. This was the um, one item that was not sub um, supported by the Planning Commission. Other changes include removing employee parking requirements. The city did look at other parking requirements for other jurisdictions, and although we are in line with them, this makes it a little bit easier for those emergency shelters, um, and so the HCD uh, liked that response as well. Uh, also clarify security and management uh, that it's not a discretionary action. It's never been a discretionary action, but there was some confusion on it, so we reworded it to make it crystal clear that there was no discretion um, about that. And then lastly, uh, right now our ordinance says a responsible service provider, although we would hope every service provider was responsible, we've been asked to remove that um, word in there also. So the recommendation is staff recommends that the city council approve and adopt the housing element as proposed and the planning commission's recommendation um, is that they concur with that but with maintaining a 300 foot separation requirements for all shelter providers and with that staff's available to answer any questions on the um, 300 foot separation this we're talking about is uh, from what I understand, HCD is, has been trying to find a way to be uh, <clears throat> increase the beds count from the, from the beginning for an operator to, to make it more uh, cost effective. I think it's the words that we heard. Um, so this is kind of like a compromise from what I understand. Go ahead. So the, the main concern that HCD has had with all of their comment letters that they submitted is that the element must demonstrate the suitability and feasibility of capacity. And that's what is being modified to address that concern. They've came up with uh, several different scenarios. One that you just explained right now is more bed counts um, or an increased area. And this was a compromise that HCD felt that addressed their concern by eliminating that 300 foot separation for same providers. But we would still require each of those to be as an independent, handled independently. Although they can have the same ownership as far as operator goes, they would both have to have to have each would have to have the same requirements inside. They they couldn't. They're not. We're not going to see 
traipsing from one to the other back and forth for food or whatever they're going to do in um, in this. They're going to be fed and housed in one and fed and housed in the other. Exactly. So you still have to comply with the development standards for that emergency shelter on each individual one. The only thing that's modified here is the separation. Okay. This one can be within 300 feet for the same provider, but same standards. Okay. And within the zone? Correct. They're all within that one specific overlay zone. But development standards in that overlay are all the same. Are they not subject to the Rancho San Clemente business park? What development standards would be different? There are specific development standards for the emergency shelter overlay. So those are the development standards I'm specifically talking about. So the only difference for any shelter would be that 300 foot separation requirement for the same operator. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I do have any cards. So I'll open the public hearing on that. Do I have any cards? Just gave you two. Oh, thank you. I have so much up here. Uh, first speaker would be Kirk Goodfellow, followed by Reverend Brenda Boss. Good evening. Kirk is not here anymore. He is also a member of my congregation. My name is uh, Pastor Brenda Boss. Um, I am here to. Uh, First of all, I'll remind you, some of you council members were um, here last October when I was the only person in the room to speak in favor of this uh, uh, zone overlay when the rest of the public hearing was adamantly opposed. Um, I want to thank you for continuing to work on this. I want to thank uh, Amber Gregg's office for their work on this. Um, I mostly am here to just say, obviously, this has been uh, a decade in the making, and we continue to struggle about what to do about the homeless in our city, and we are not alone, clearly. As we know, Dana Point is turning their attention to it. All of South Orange County is turning their attention to it. The whole country is. And so I want to just encourage you that there are still many people in San Clemente who wish to see this happen, because we understand that we would have to decide as a city, who do we want to be? And we don't want to be a city that has poor people in the streets living in, on, in, in, in bushes and uh, on our trails. A couple of weeks ago, I was on the North Beach Trail uh, at 6.30 in the morning, and a young guy with a bike was coming out of a bush. And another woman walking by me said, oh, that shouldn't happen. And I think she meant that guy shouldn't live in a bush. I thought it shouldn't happen we should figure out how to provide a person like that with housing. Now, I know this is an incredibly complicated issue, and I'm not just going to say, let's just fix it, because I think it's too hard for that. But I want to come here tonight to encourage you and to support you and to say thank you for your continued efforts on this. And the way to take care of ho homelessness in America is to provide housing. And uh, we've discovered that trying to get people to get it together and then get them a house doesn't work. And so, once again, I want to ask you to pass this. I know that there are parts of it that aren't exactly right, and you'll have to look at it again when you have to do the next four-year plan. God bless you in that, and we continue to support you in that. But um, the idea is we need to get people off the street into housing, even if it's temporary shelters. And then once they have a roof over their head, then they can stabilize. And um, as always, I, I completely support the idea that this needs to be an incredibly professionally run shelter, that it needs to have professionals that are providing health care, um, addiction care, those types of things. It's not going to work just to stick people in this and hope it's OK. Um, so we want to continue to support that as well. So I just want to let you know that there are still many, many people in San Clemente that wish to have this happen, wish to do the right thing, wish to take care of the poor and the mentally ill and the veteran and the homeless family. And so I, I ask you to please uh, approve this and then uh, continue to do uh, more work to do even better in the next uh, four-year plan. Thank you. Okay. Is there a motion? Yeah. Close the public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Close the public hearing, and I'll ask for a motion. I move that we adopt Resolution 1729, titled Resolution City Council, City of San Clemente, California, adopting and addendum of the previously certified San, uh, San Clemente uh, Centennial General Plan Environmental Impact Report, 
State Clearing House number 201 304 1021 regarding the 2013 2021 housing element update and approving general plan uh, amendment GPA 15 331 to adopt the housing element update and authorize staff to provide uh, to provide the housing uh, adopted housing element to the Department of Housing and Community Development and introduce ordinance number 1645 entitled Lawrence's City of San Clemente, California, amending subdivision. D1, D5, E1, and E4 of section 1756, 100 of chapter 1756, title 17 of the San Clemente Municipal Code relating to emergency shelters pursuant to an addendum to the previously certified San Clemente Centennial General Plan Environmental Impact Report, State Clearing House number 201-304-1021. I'll second what he said. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem Brown, second by Councilmember Swartz. All in favor? Aye. Passes four. One. Four zero. Four I would like to add, <clears throat> while we're on that subject, that uh, no, 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 I'm going to talk about lift real quick. Um, I got to sit in for Councilmember Swartz at the Public Safety Task Force, and Mary Purdue from FAM was there and she said that she had 123 a bill for 123 people for a month using lift to get to the fam really? yes so it's working so i wanted to bring that up and in case anyone listening doesn't understand or to know what the lift program is you can get anywhere you can get from any bus stop in our city to any other bus stop in our city for two bucks that's all it is it's an app it's easy to use if you want to grab a lift and take it over to the outlets and then you can go on a, your free trolley ride up and down San Clemente you can do that but the lift is there for our citizens to use you don't have to worry about a bus schedule it's right there for you but I thought it was interesting that she had that data mm -hmm. and that was in That's one great. month so that was good okay next item Next is a report from the Public Works Director, City Engineer, concerning removal of trees at Water Reservoir Number 1. Good evening, uh, Mayor Ward and City Council members. Tom Bonnegat, Public Works Director. Did you have somewhere to go tonight after this? <laughs> yes, so I'm going to be brief. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, the item before you concerns the potential removal of trees around the city's reservoir number one site at the south end of town. So per your latest direction in May, staff has gone off and we've um, uh, undertaken your directive since then. We went out to public bid to get costs for the removal of the trees around the reservoir. That information is described and that cost is in your packet. And we also coordinated with the uh, local neighbors uh, to solicit the potential for cost sharing per your direction in May and that is also described in the report. I do have Randy Little, our maintenance services manager here. He's the expert and done all the legwork on it and either him or I will be happy to answer any questions but at this time we are seeking your direction on whether or not to proceed with removal of the trees at that site and that's my report. I do have one public card. Do you want to hear from the public first? Sure. Okay. Uh, Chris Stewart. Hi, my name's Chris Stewart. We have lived in San Clemente for 45 years. We have owned our business in San Clemente for 40 years. And we live directly above the reservoir. And our, our home price that we paid reflected the ocean and uh, the beautiful ocean and golf course views that we had at one time. Um, these trees do not block, oh, a second. These trees do not block our views, but many of our other um, neighbors also. We and our neighbors have paid a few times to have the city trees trimmed extensively. The owner before us also paid a, a, with the neighbors to have the trees remo uh, uh, trimmed. When we moved in, there were a lot less trees. We used to have a large circular opening from the trees. Many new trees have sprouted up and grown quite large. Also, the pine trees are getting very thick and uh, multiplying. These trees were supposed to be maintained by, regularly by the city, which they were not. When we had tr them trimmed, we had outside landscapers do it and did not pay the prevailing rate that you were requiring now. These meetings started a few years ago when then Mayor Bob Baker 
was trying to implement a good neighbor policy with the city trees that were blocking people's views. Recently, we have had a few fires close to us on Camp Pendleton, which we could easily see from our home. All these trees are a major fire hazard. Eucalyptus trees, plants are highly flammable along with the pines. All these meetings for the past few years need to come to an end, and the city just needs to take the responsibility and get this done. This needs to be resolved and taken off all the agendas, which has taken up a lot of the city employees' times. If the city had maintained them regularly, yearly, it would not have come to this high amount. I believe in one to two years, you plan to be expanding the water tank right below our house, next to the trees, and you uh, are planning on removing the trees for that. Why not do it now for us and our neighbors to enjoy the views we originally paid for? Like Bob Baker and his good neighbor policy was meant to do. <coughs> Plus, we are not getting younger. We are 64 and 65. Let us have our views back. Plus, the bid will surely be higher in a few years. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Alan Corson. And Alan, you're going to be trying to use this card for the rest Maybe of I'll them. I'll go and do another one. I will try. I'm trying to save paper. Yes, I will try to reuse it. It's very fitting for the topic discussion. Save trees. Or maybe we could cut down these trees and make paper out of them. Um, anyway, uh, I've been at most of the hearings that you've had about preserving the steward's view. And what it basically amounts to is that where he was originally going to come in and pay for 100% to cut down the trees, now he's willing to put up 10 to 20 percent, or anywhere from six to twelve thousand dollars of the sixty-six thousand dollars, so that his view could be enhanced and preserved. I think it's laudable. I mean, if I were him, I probably wanted to, but I'm not. I'm another one of the 65,000 residents of San Clemente. Now, let's assume that you go in your benevolence and you give. 60 some odd thousand dollars to cut down his tree what's going to happen when the trees in the canyon that maybe are blocking your trees mayor as you mentioned last time you don't want them cut down now but maybe you'll want them cut down in the future and that good neighbor policy will extend to your own we in our new general plan called for a tree preservation ordinance it was one of the priority items on the general plan and the action measures. Nothing has happened since. All that we've had is more opportunities to cut down trees. Another one later on in the ag agenda is the trees on Esplanade. And we're talking about another 17 trees. As I drove up here tonight and I looked out in the parking lot, there used to be some big, beautiful ficus trees. Those are gone. I haven't seen anybody replanting those. I don't know what is the haste to remove trees in this city. Councilman Brown said, well, we're not going to cut down the pine trees. And yet the pine trees are now on the list. We need a tree preservation ordinance as it was asked for, called for, and spelled out in the general plan, not a view preservation ordinance for the sake of a few in the city. I wish that you would please consider this when you're making your decision. I know it's been on the agenda for many times, but it's a big item to put in there to save somebody's view. Thank you very much. Okay, that was our last speaker. Um, Tom, I don't know if you want to come back up. I originally had asked for this to be on. Um, it started back when I was on the Planning Commission, this issue. Um, we ruled on it that at that time that it was a fire hazard. We did not rule on it as a view preservation. Um, at that time, four years ago almost, I think we were told that there was a landscape plan at this reservoir and that they were on a seven-year cutting maintenance schedule. But now we know that's not true. The reservoirs do not have landscaping. We don't normally plant trees around them. I think this is the only one. Is that correct? Um, do you? Yeah. I'm going to have Randy answer. Right, he does. One. Yeah. We have 13 reservoir sites, and nine of them are under landscape maintenance contracts. 
Reservoir 1 has no landscaping. It just has these trees outside the fence of the perimeter. But okay. we do have nine sites we do maintain. And we have a landscape plan for those? Yes. Okay, I was told, hold on one second. I was told differently on that, so I, I understand that. But it still plays into what I'm saying is we planted trees at this reservoir. The city did it. Did we plant them? We did plant them. It, that's been, we've, we know that. But not, we never set up a landscape plan. And the reason no. that all these people came to us almost four years ago is that these trees were not getting trimmed. So I understand there's probably not uh, support from the council for us to pay more for these because the council only agreed to do it if the residents paid for half. Um, they've already paid to trim them. I get that there's probably not support for that, but I cannot allow this reservoir to go, this area to go any longer without having approved trimming. Um, one of the things that we said on the Planning Commission is that right away the city had to go and aggressively trim and maintain these trees. Right now we only go over there when one falls over. One fell over in the street a year or two ago. So what I would ask for the council tonight if we could do that is staff goes and finds out from our contractor what it's going to cost to trim these and that this is on a regular maintenance schedule as it should be and maybe we wouldn't we wouldn't be having this discussion no there isn't any no he, Randy was just giving me some background um, depending on the questions but I don't so, There isn't uh, an approved landscape pellet that I'm aware of. They were, it's been established that the city planted those years ago, um, decades. Um, and one of your previous discussions was that, um, and right now the reservoir is tentatively scheduled for replacement about five years out, plus or minus. And at that time, your council wanted us to look at a holistic updated plan. Um, but we have what we have now. I'm, I'm not aware of any formal plan that blessed that. Um, again, these trees are decades old. I don't know so if that answers your question. We haven't maintained them. You have one other question. Yeah, trimming. Is there a trimming plan? Um, well, if we put them on a regular cycle, Randy was just telling me, we put them on a seven to eight year cycle. We have done, and th I don't think it was noted in this report, in your May report, we talked about there have been occasions where we've gone out and, and trimmed them, or uh, I forgot what the term was, to address fire authority requirements. And that was, no, that was noted in your uh, May right. 2nd report. That was so they have done. gotten some attention. Uh, they haven't been entirely neglected. I can't speak to uh, past efforts to coordinate with private owners on trimming. Randy might be able to, if that's relevant to your discussion. I'll just say that's the one thing that we found out, is that these are like no man's land, and we are not maintaining them. And so that's what I'm asking for. Okay. First of all, um, I, we've discussed this before, and I think I'm on record. I would love to see every one of our eucalyptus trees replaced with something that's not, not, a not, not, not a weed and not not a matchstick waiting to go off. Um, so I, I'm, behind, I'm behind us working towards that. Um, I was hesitant before when the uh, homeowner was going to pick up half, only because we are setting a precedent, and mm -hmm. and. I can tell you there's a lot of homeowners uh, that would like to have trees trimmed. Uh, and I recall a homeowners association hiring people and put them in, made them look like they were Caltrans employees and went down and cut down the eucalyptus on the freeway. So, you know, the, the people have gotten in trouble for this. Um, and, and so I, 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 I again, uh, I think maybe if we can clean it up for now, and then discuss a citywide palette and replacement of these and work it into, into a maintenance budget to replace the eucalyptus as we can in the places and come up with a palette for it to be replaced with. Uh, I don't think we should just yank trees out. I think we should replace them with something that's going to be less uh, fire hazard and slower growth. Um, that I think it would be a good thing to do, but um, I'm having trouble right now with this. How far into the life cycle of these trees are we? I mean, are these things have another 50 years of growth that they'll be having at that I cycle? don't think so, but Randy's my tree expert, and he's familiar Randy with that. Randy, the tree expert, him. come speak yep. truth. 
Uh, the lifespan of an urban tree, which these would be considered, are anywhere from 50 to 70 years. I have no idea how old these trees are or when they were planted. We don't have any records at all. Uh, yeah, you don't need to answer that. So we don't need any quality. We don't need any comments. Thank you. Appreciate your content. So rent. I'm sorry, if you don't, Randy. Why don't you ask if, him uh, to be escorted out if he keeps making comments? Yeah, he's sitting next to the lieutenant. If if we didn't approve this tonight, because I don't know that we have support for this, uh, could, we could direct staff to have a uh, an arborist go over there and and take a look at these trees and see what it's going to take to bring them up to how they should have been trimmed. Yes, we have a we tree. have a certified arborist, and one of Rod's staff is a certified arborist. We could get them in the cycle for a minimal amount of money every seven to eight years with the rest of the city trees, um, and have them maintained. Yes, there's there's 57 total. Right, but wouldn't initially there be there's going to be some cost initially because these have, haven't been trimmed by the city. We don't know that. No, but. we do. Unfortunately, we do know it. I wouldn't think it would be a significant increase in cost other than the regular maintenance cost, okay. if any. Well, that's going to be my my ask. For the okay, council. then I'll make a motion here, which is well, that uh, may, we... May I just make one, yeah. one brief suggestion? So um, we obviously have a plan in five years. There's 57, um, you know, 57 trade. Would you have any thought to simply thinning out? what we have there instead of 57 well I think that the need here is to be fair and equitable we have a whole community that we serve and I think we have policies that we have a maintenance policy um, for how we manage trees and from the JPIA point of view it's important that we're even-handed with that policy so I think we simply direct staff to incorporate these trees into the maintenance policy um, with the thought that it's sooner rather than later because there may be some deferred um, maintenance that needs to be attended to and we just end it right there um, okay. I'd like that to be right away though because we did rule on it's in our records that the Planning Commission thought, recommended the council that this was a fire hazard because of the overgrowth, and I know that's why. But it's not. Randy that's not what we're I deliberating know. tonight. He went out and did that, you know, brought them up. So. But can we direct staff to? You're talking about moving them up on the schedule. Yeah, they, they need to be on a schedule. No. I know. Yeah. Add, a, add, add them to the, the schedule and use their professional the, the discretion the to put them in as appropriate, yeah. given the concerns that we have. Actually, I think the direction should be go out there post haste with some aggressive trimming program more I mean you, you basically have years of deferred maintenance right, uh, right. That, that we've done on these trees get an aggressive pruning schedule one that is you know can bring them up to speed where they are and then put them into the cycle at that point I think delaying it and just throwing them into the mix isn't necessary we obviously have more of a need here because they haven't been addressed let's get an aggressive you know trimming policy thin, thin them out as appropriate and then and then moving forward put yeah, the maintenance that's what policy. We just, I was just saying put it on top of the list yeah but Fine, but, but it's into right. the maintenance policy. We're not doing anything. I mean, if there's deferred maintenance that's part of our protocol. It has to catch up. The arborists can come back and tell us if they think they should thin some out, or they can come back and tell us what they should do. Uh, what's your, your uh, motion? Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to move that we give staff direction to incorporate uh, actually the four outstanding um, water sites. Um, into the um, into the landscape maintenance plan um, with the direction that this particular water reservoir number one be at the top of the list um, and that it get the attention it deserved given that it's been deferred or overlooked or excluded from the plan okay motion by Don check second by ham all in favor aye, aye. passes five zero okay thank, thank you, you. And I return to us if there's a budget impact that we unwittingly just created. Okay. Next is a report from the Public Works Director, City Engineer, concerning the possibility of extending San Clemente trolley service through September 2017. So, Mayor Ward and City Council members, this is at the Council's request to consider extending the trolley as just noted um, and as I noted in the report and as you are well aware the trolley has been uh, wildly successful exceeded all of our expectations and in including another successful Labor Day weekend which was supposed to be the 
planned conclusion of the summer service, and, and that's where we stand, absent any other direction. So I have a cost estimate from our provider. Um, the council inquired as to the possibility of extending basically the current service. Um, in the report, it says through the end of September, the actual last day would be Sunday, October 1st. And so uh, staff's looking for your direction. I did point out the challenges now that um, um, bus drivers are in much higher demand again. Uh, we could only run the Thursday service with two trolleys and I try to put an upper limit on the cost because of scheduling if drivers have to come from far away that will incur overtime charges the operator will try and use local drivers as much as possible it's just prime time now for drivers uh, but we're confident that we won't exceed the 35,000 cost for the service outlined before you so with that we'll look to your direction I just had one question. I was the big advocate for Thursday for the summer, and it proved to be um, a very successful day. But I'm seeing now that school's back in session, that our numbers uh, last week, for example, on Thursday, dropped. It does. Is there any um, value to just taking Thursday out of the mix, or does uh, that confuse the user? Thursday's still been much more successful than our than our minimum, even this last weekend. Friday, actually, this last weekend was was the down day, but still pretty well. I think that just had to do with probably the possibly the the extreme heat and people not wanting to be in the open air trolley. That's just mm -hmm. my guess, um, but we still had overall great ridership this last weekend. Um, Thursday typically has lagged the weekend days, but still also average 20 to 30 riders per hour per trolley, which, you know, well, is my two favorite to three times. statistic you shared by email uh, today was we've had over 90,000 boardings cumulatively over the summer. That's incredible. Right. So for the total summer, and as I mentioned, um, we'll give you a more comprehensive report in about a month's time or so, but uh, we were in the somewhere in the 50s, 50 um, plus riders per hour per trolley for the entire summer all days included. And um, think of all the cars that took off the road and all the parking that freed up in downtown. What's Dome. the average on the other trolleys? And, and uh, we are the most, I'll, I'll, I, I don't have the current, but we are the most successful in the Orange County system on a right. boarding. And part of our report? Even we do better than Laguna, and the reason is Laguna, we have a very strategic route. Laguna has routes that go up in Rim of the World, and so you know their PCH trolley probably beats us hands down but when, you when we give you the look system. back on year one and, and lessons learned and everything we will also compare ridership to uh, San Juan, Dana Point and Laguna Beach to give you some context. And, and don't forget that same reports going to include discussions regarding <laughs> revenue advertising and tying in with the other cities as far as well, it'll service. include recommendations on considerations and, and a process for doing that. We won't have all the answers on that okay, report, no. but but we'll lay out the considerations and how we try and address those so you can make a decision for year two service. Uh, let me ask, is there anyone from the public that would like to speak about the trolleys? Nope. Is there any discussion? I'll make the motion. I move that we... Um, Direct staff to provide additional trolley service uh, to terminate October 1st. So we would approve and authorize the mayor to execute amendment number two to contract C17-11 by and between the city of San Clemente and professional parking and transportation services to extend San Clemente trolley service through uh, October 1st, this amendment increases the contract cost from 93,342 to a total not to exceed a, a amount of 128,342, an increase of $35,000, and that we also approve a supplemental appropriation in the amount of 35,000 from the Air Quality Fund and Designated Fund balance to account 019-819-45300-000-000. -00 Motion by Donchuk, second by Swartz. All in favor? Aye. Passes 5-0. Thank you. Tom. Thank you. I think I'm up next. I'll just stay here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK. Uh, next is a report from the Public Works Director, City Engineer, concerning the removal and replacement of the Esplanade median trees. Uh, Council members, uh, Mayor, I'm going to be recusing myself from this item because I live within 500 feet of the property. Being Discussed. Thank you. We're not within 500 feet of each other. 
So Mayor Ward and Council Members, the item here is for your consideration to uh, remove uh, a certain number of trees from the Espelon median in the 100 and 200 blocks and then replace those. As I mentioned in the report, uh, the short story is that we have, um, and we have uh, looked at it with a certified arborist, we have 17 trees, Brazilian pepper trees, uh, spread out amongst the 100 and 200 blocks of the median of Esplanade that are damaged uh, beyond saving. It's our recommendation that they be removed. The detailed memo in your report explains the considerations that we made and why we feel like we could replace them like for like with the same species and, and reasonably be assured of their success. And there were four trees that were previously removed. They're already gone and, and we would propose to also replace those gaps. Um, the details on the size of the tree, again, to try and minimize the um, kind of disparity between the tree size. Um, and we have coordinated with some of the neighbors. We also noticed everyone on the 100 and 200 blocks, but our recommendation to you is for the reasons in the report that we take those out and replace them with the same trees for the continuity in the median. And um, again, I have Randy here who can answer any detailed questions you may have. I'm sure we have speaker cards on this, right? But before we, uh, before we hear from the community on this issue, can we just have one of you elaborate on why we're not uh, mending some of these trees back to good health as opposed to just removing and replacing? I'll let Randy speak, but uh, basically the short answer is we don't think we can bring them back. They are pretty well, um, in, in some cases, partly totally dead or on their way there where we don't think they can be rehabilitated with any treatments. And if you have something further to ask, answer. Yeah, they, we've got an issue with Pitothra root rot that's present in the median. Um, we looked into treating the median, trying to save those trees, the, but with the roots touching each tree, that is what causes the transfer of the fungus. Um, so the removal is necessary. We've had many failures, especially this last year in the storms in January. We lost half of several trees. Um, we've had to remove them for that reason. And if you go on the median, you can, in the infected 17 trees, you can actually stick your finger into the trunk. It's just sponge. And they're going to fail. It's just a matter of when. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up to the public. Uh, first speaker, John Dowell, followed by Alyssa Venkis. Okay, uh, next speaker after Alyssa is uh, Mick O'Malley, followed by Alan Corson and Georgette Corson. So, yes, thank you. Before we, uh, there's one more thing before we hear from the audience as well. I'd just like to thank everybody for staying this late. I know it's uh, 9 o'clock on a Tuesday is not early for most people, so thank you for sticking around to, to make your comments heard. Hi, Alyssa Vankis from San Clemente and I'm very tired of staying late. Um, I just want to say I was raised on Esplanade, so the trees are really sentimental to me as well, and they're, a lot of them are older than I am. I personally, along with I think a lot of other residents on the street, would like to know um, that all the trees that are removed are replaced, like you said, so that made me happy to hear. Um, but I also want to know proof of all diseased trees and if that can be provided to the residents, and if it's done by a professional that's not also removing the trees, and then also if that can be proven, like he mentioned, that if they can't be mended or have other treatment. Um, also, I wanna make sure that the birds are looked after and make sure there's no nests in any trees that are removed. Um, and secondly, I wanted to just address that the grass needs to be replaced. <laughs> and that the trees and the grass need to be watered and maintained. Thank you. That's it. Mr. O'Malley. Yeah, hi, Mick O'Malley. I'm just a little over half century resident, San Clemente. I believe that Ole Hansen had a plan in the late 1800s, and you know, that is the original equestrian trail. City Hall, the hospital, the stables, all that stuff. Now you want to take those trees out? Fine. It's a pleasure to address the Department of Transportation of the United States of America. Because what you guys are saying is you have more power than DOT. That, a tryst, that street is being used as commercial truck traffic to supply vendors on Del Mar. That's illegal, federally. Now, I don't know when you guys got promoted to the Department of Transportation, but it's illegal. 
period. This doesn't belong in California Supreme. It belongs nowhere except for the Department of Transportation <laughs> per DOT rules. You cannot run commercial trucks, 80,000 pound trucks, down a residential street to supply businesses, period. Those trees grow 10 meters high, 30 feet, and 10 meters around. You, they're trimming them for 15 foot tall trucks, nonsense. You guys do not have the authority to do this. You are imposing your law over the United States of America, nonsense. Ole Hansen went broke five times putting this town together. Now, you want to just say baloney to Ole? That's the original equestrian trail, the steel bridge that went across it. I don't know anybody who's been around here. Anybody been here half century? No, nope, don't think so. Anyways, uh, so, you know, just kind of a local resident. My, I don't believe we should cut those trees down. And if we do, zone us commercial per Department of Transportation rules. This jumps over California Supreme and goes right straight to DOT. You guys, stronger than... If you can impose C, uh, San Clemente law on the United States of America, get busy. You do not have the authority, and you never will. You did not address the 30,000 residents about, we're going to tear down the town's history. In address, I didn't see anybody get in a, a letter in this town. Every, you know, 30,000 people didn't get letters or notifications. We did 100 and 200 block Esplanade. That's, you know, that's following, that's nonsense to Reed's Rules of Orders. You cannot do that. It, like I said, you guys are not the Department of Transportation unless I'm hallucinating or, you know, and I'm in DC. You, you do not have the authority, not even with Cal Supreme on you. Department of Transportation rules say, as a ex commercial driving instructor, can't do it. That drive through, illegal, bought, variance. Chris, criminal, pirates. Thank you, Mr. O'Malley. All right. I appreciate you three. quoting, I appreciate you quoting Ole Hansen. Uh, Alan Corson, followed by Georgette. Okay. She, Georgette's going to speak for you. Good evening. <laughs> um, I'm going to begin uh, by saying that the neighbors are very happy that you've chosen to retain the Brazilian peppers as the palate. It's a great tree. It's um, bushy enough to provide the noise attenuation. It's pretty. It's fast growing. It provides berries for the birds. Uh, it helps cleanse our air. And I think that staying with that same palate is a, a big improvement. Uh, I only met, in, unless uh, um, Mr. Little met with somebody else, but he met with me a long time ago, maybe three months ago. And um, at that time, maybe two months ago, at that time, uh, there were less trees that were going to be removed. So at that time, uh, he gave me a list, which I still have, and um, it had 14 trees, I believe, that were going to be removed, and it had three trees that were going to be monitored. And those trees, it said right here, crown uh, d drying out, minimal signs of a decay, need to monitor at 202. And now that's slated now for removal. And then 214, there are minor signs of root rot, but the tree looks healthy, need to monitor. It's now slated for removal. 222, there are minor signs of root rot, but the tree looks healthy, need to monitor. That's 222. It's now going to be removed. So I have to assume that maybe it's just easier to just remove them all at one time and be done with it. But I think the neighbors move there because of the trees. They love the trees, the bark, the trunk. It's beautiful. It's like a sculpture. And if the tree is starting to wane, but it has life in it, let's wait a little while. Let's plant the ones where there's dead trees or where there's really dying trees or dangerous trees or whatever we want to refer to them, um, or no trees, and put in the Brazilian peppers, let them grow, and then monitor the three that three months ago or two months ago were going to be monitored. Um, I would love it if there had been a um, soil sample done. They say it says amaryllis root rot, 
the, re the only way to really know that for sure is to do a soil sample. I called and I talked to a lab that does that. Uh, it was $99 to have the soil tested. Um, I was going to do it on my own, but I thought, you know, it's getting a little brazen out there digging up the soil and taking it off to Anaheim and challenging. You know, we have our own people here. But I, I just would feel more comfortable if we're going to remove these trees because they have amaryllis root rot to verify that. It's not very expensive to do it. Um, let's see. It's not really clear from the written materials which trees are going to be removed. Sometimes uh, there'll be two trees at 128, there'll be two trees. I would feel better if they put a little marker on it so that people know. Uh, there's one or two trees that just look so healthy. If you go down there and look at them, you'll see what I'm talking about. They're vibrant looking and they're slated for removal. Um, Valencia, I went down there and looked at what they have and um, they have meandering grass with planters. Is there a plan for our grass? Is there a plan for irrigation once you put in new trees? Are we going to have some drip lines? I'm going to ask that of staff after you're done. Yeah, because that's something that the residents are concerned about. There were, there were a lot of people concerned, and they were going to be here tonight to speak. Several of them already left. Uh, Kathy Mart lost, lost her mother, and so she's not here. So I'm kind of it. And, um, you know, I, I'm happy that you've picked the Brazilian pepper. That's a good thing. And I know that Randy's put a lot of work into this. So I appreciate that. And I would just urge you to save maybe the three trees that weren't originally going to be cut down. And then include us in what you're going to do in the landscaping area, the green area, the grass area. Thank you. Thank you. Two For staff? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you are going to speak. Yeah, I was just going to have her. Ah. I made another card for you. Later. Okay. This is the last card. This is the last card. This is the last card. But the I last thought last he was card. going to let Georgette speak. Yeah, I, 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 first. Extra time. I, I deferred to her to speak okay. first. Hit the button on him. Twice. The timer. Timer. Okay. Uh, I, first of all, I agree with everything she said because we go home together. Um, but anyway, the, it would be nice, as she said, if you could leave those trees that are not so far gone, it would leave it looking beautiful. And everybody that we've ever talked to on Esplanade bought there for those trees and the look of that street. And we would appreciate keeping it. Secondly, if any new trees are to survive and flourish, they need irrigation. Putting these bags by the trunk of the tree, I think that's probably why they got root rot in the first place. There's ways of taking the current irrigation that they do have, and I understand you don't want to irrigate grass, but we're over the supposed you know, drought right now, uh, is transfer them into drip lines. Put it, and there's many devices that are out there to let this happen easily. Put drip lines around the trees, convert the sprinkler heads into these drip lines. You'll have a much more flourishing tree. You'll use much less water, and everybody will be happy. And uh, I hope that in doing, I, first of all, I thank you for your comments about the trees around the reservoir to trim them. That's what needs to be done. I'm thrilled that the trolley line is <laughs> is functioning the way it's supposed to be functioning. I had doubts, but it looks great. And, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing. And second of all, I think Mr. Gregory has met his match. I saw him earlier, and and we have his his brother in over here, uh, you know, to fill in when he's not here. So we got a one-two punch. Thank you very much. Good. Go ahead. Before he asks his question, I have to correct one thing Alan said, and that's that we should be using more water now, Alan. Did you miss Brad's presentation? We have water. We should be using more of it, not less. So he's unhappy that you said we should use less water. Just yeah. Randy. Hi. Hi. Could I just answer what I heard? Well, we let me ask. No. Wait, let's have him answer the questions first before okay. we do comments. Okay. And I, have, I wrote them down, so if you miss any. Okay. I'll 
I'm on the hot seat. Um, we don't water turf in medians. That is still not allowed by the state. So just Governor, to make that clear. <coughs> Governor um, Brown, correct? That is correct. Um, my intent was if you were to approve the replanting of the trees, the revegetation of the median, we would use the existing irrigation in the turf. We would cap it off completely in the turf and run a, a bubbler over to each tree. It would be on the controller and all would be good and we would not be watering turf. The three trees um, that she spoke of have since shown um, declining and they are also showing fruiting bodies on the trunk, which is the last final stage prior to death for those trees. Um, when we were out there, we did have a certified arborist with us as well as a pest control advisor. Um, and just the visible signs, I'm more than willing to do a soil test. I have no issues with that, but it is so apparent we did not do a soil test. So that's kind of where it stands at this point. Do we need to do anything to remediate the soil? Once the trees are removed, we're going to treat it with pelletized sulfur and that will hold the disease down and then we'll put it on a maintenance schedule for that. Um, and the only time that the disease is transferred typically is when the roots from two separate trees touch each other. So it's, it's a ways down and the reason we stayed with Brazilian peppers was to keep the integrity of the aesthetics of the neighborhood. Uh, the, the real thing that should happen would be crop rotation given the disease, but we're going to treat it and stick with the same species. Yeah, because I want to, and also I, I, as I look through, some of these trees have more going on than that same rot. They've got termites and there's, there's issues, issues all over the place. Over the place. Some of them are dead. Um, but my concern is, is if we leave a sickly tree that's not dead and we try to nurse it back to health but aren't we keeping that same disease in the soil that can then contaminate well if we were to leave a if we were leaving a contaminated tree in the soil and it was mature like they are the roots could be out there 20 to 30 feet and we could unknowingly plant a tree right next to an existing root and have wasted our time and the uh, last question i have regarding that spot is do we have recycled water going to it or are we using to that median no this is the old part of town. Well, it's time to dig up their streets and put it in. Um, it, then we would have improved streets. We'd actually I won't be so appreciate that. <laughs> Chris, go ahead. Yeah, I have a couple more questions that uh, I heard from the audience. So the first one is, what, you know, I, I commend you on your report. There's a, a ton of good photos here of each tree that's planned for removal and the vacant ones that aren't there anymore. There are a couple trees that in, you know, my basic inspection going down there and then in these photos that look very healthy. Mm -hmm. So how, how can you be telling me that these trees are unhealthy when they, to the, <coughs> the naked eye, they look very healthy? Well, there's several, there's 37 total trees. So we're, there's going to be, what is that, 17 remaining, 16 remaining that we aren't going to take. No, no, in your photos here, there's a couple like tree 110. It looks gorgeous. Uh, there's a few well, in here that you took photos that you marked for. And we have some that have been damaged by the storms. They have irregular canopies. Uh, they're not balanced canopies, and they're a risk for failure. Okay, perfect. Um, this one's probably more for Tom and James. At what point did you guys designate the commercial district on Esplanade to get all that commercial traffic to go down there to get to Del Mar? Or are you saying that didn't happen? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I just don't understand. So we're not directing any commercial trucks about. to go down Esplanade to get to no. Delmar. I, yeah, I played ignorance. 80,000 ton trucks, I don't So we're not remember re restocking that. the snack bar going down Esplanade commercial trucks at T Street. Well, that, the snack bar only uses 20,000, not... Oh, not, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which trees? We've got that one, healthy trees. What's the thought, uh, Randy, for that we're not doing these in, this in sections? So why aren't we doing, you know, the top third? you know, this quarter and then next quarter we do the It's to re retain the um uniformity of the street. If let's say we do 10 trees this year and five or 10 years down the road, it's going to have this effect like this to where if they're all done at the okay. same time, they will grow at the same rate and eventually reach the same canopy they have now. Okay. How long will that take roughly to get to the, get that canopy? 15 to 25 years. Okay. Here. I was just going to say, we just want, we want to get those yeah, the, yeah. The, root, the roots out of there so yeah. if you only take out part and you still leave some for next year to do it you're we're then yeah. not killing our trees and we are replacing them with 36 inch box trees we're like 10 to 12 feet above grade that's we normally only use 24 inch box so it's an upgrade from what we typically plant in an effort to try to get the aesthetics back 
if you go up to a 48, uh, it goes exponentially through the roof with cost. Yeah. With the cost of the yeah. Okay. Uh, one more question that was, that was brought up here that uh, it's so under fiscal impact, the, the concern was brought up that Rod's Tree Service is purposely uh, reviewing these trees as negative so they can repair and replace them. Is the budget for this one project significant enough to uh, put a dent in the annual amount that we pay to Rod's Tree Service for their services? I don't quite understand. There's your an question. impropriety out there that Rod's Tree Service is intentionally saying that these trees are no longer healthy to inflate their budget this year to buy new trucks. I work very closely them. with Rod and his grandsons, and they're the most highest integrity people I've worked with in my career. Yeah, I it was never even considered. That's yeah. not what this is about. That's what I figured the answer was. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, that's interesting because I was going to point out uh, for the record that to have Rod's Tree Service to have not one, not two, but three people here so they can hear firsthand um, what the community's concerns are is, is very impressive um, admirable. for people who have day jobs to be here at 9 o'clock in this not capacity. Good. Yeah. Um, uh, are you ready for a recommendation? I am. Lauren Kramer, you were here to talk about watering. We All right. Okay. Hurry up. You can move fast. Sorry, I, I was writing really quick because I wanted to. Get it's a different to idea than the bubbler, at each tree. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I, I just when I heard about this, I started researching it at home last night, and there's because I live one block away from Esplanade, and uh, we have a median as well that's not maintained, and I know it's because of the drought, but there's other options out there as far as like using reclaimed water, which is what um, I think. You had mentioned as I was writing out the, the the form, asking him if there is any kind of recycled water, which I really think it would be a great idea. There's only a couple medians in that area, and people are using that that whole circle to go to the beach. So to maintain it, when you're spending all this money to put the trees in, that's why I'm, that's why I wanted to speak because there's a process, and if you do it backwards, it's just eating more money. So if you have a plan, like with the I mean, if the trees need to be replaced, then replace them, but make sure that they're rotted. You know, basically, the reclaimed water is why I wanted to speak. So if that's all. All right. I was trying to figure out what you would have to say on difference on watering, so. I get yeah, that. the reclaimed water. And then also, okay. there's one other thing. If, if you want to save money on watering, you could actually add some bricks along either side of the median to like lessen the turf so but I'm sure you you can figure that out but that if you have a, a plan to replace trees I think it should be done all at once and all the, the medians at once be, okay yeah so I will just make a comment to that that I think we strive to try to do recycled water projects and it has a lot to do with how close there's a source for recycled water and I think it's pretty far from that area It's so far away. I thought this might come up, so I oh. talked with my utilities friends. And we have, it isn't close. Um, and our ballpark estimate to serve Esplanade would be probably in the $400,000 range. We'd have to build a pump system to get it up from our recycled water line that's along the beach trail. We have a line that goes down the beach trail and up Calafia to serve the Muni Golf Course. Um, but we'd need to put a new pump system to get up to Esplanade. We think, you know, ballpark 400,000 for that one street you start adding streets it, it goes up and there wouldn't be a lot of demand um, to us to recommend to you to actually do that it, it's just not that we don't have it now and it's pretty big dollars to do it could it be done sure we're not sure if that really is a cost-effective way to, to get well, recycled if you look around their streets where they live so be sure to check everything of that out and we can find more more uses for recycled water in the area that we'll be happy to tear their streets up to to put it in so you just check it out i'm happy with the recommendation of a, the bubbler yeah. i was concerned about the water because i know we can't water medians the turf anymore so i'm happy that randy little came up with a solution for that yeah. so is there a motion yeah, before we, before we make the motion i just want to comment one more thing laurie 
Uh, I just want to say thanks to everybody who came out and spoke this evening. I know there's been a lot of concern about uh, Esplanade, and Esplanade is a very cherished street, not only for us, but the entire community of San Clemente. And so the fact that everybody took the time out of their day to stay till 9 o'clock to make their voices heard and hopefully create a better product, I think shows a lot about this community and how much we all care. And so uh, with that, no one up here enjoys cutting down or removing historical trees just like these trees are, but it's something unfortunately has to be done. And so with that, I'll approve the removal of 17 disease trees with Esplanade, within the Esplanade Street median 100 and 200 blocks and approve the planting of 21 new Brazilian pepper trees. Second. Motion by hand, second by Doncheck. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 4 0. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Two nice suit. Back. Dave is going to be your first. Oh, Dave. So, since this has been up, this is we've been around the block on this. We could probably, unless there's questions, there just move the item. I do have a question. Uh -huh. Only sure. because. Where's Tim? Okay, we'll wait for Tim to come back in. The only question I have is, it said we were approving reach number one only, and that was rehoming uh, the pigeons and the deterrent under, a partial deterrent under the pier, I think the first half. Right. to uh, So where in this process is the contract going to be coming back to us for rehoming the, the birds? So what's before you this evening is a recommendation to um, re put in netting from the fishermen's to zero tower. Um, and then staff has been researching the option to rehome the pigeons. And one of the challenges is finding a purveyor that um, will have a humane use for the homing pigeons. So that's been a challenge so far. Um, we have time to continue researching that if the council approves this evening. Um, it'll take probably six to eight months for the netting to be installed, so it would be good to have the rehoming done at the same time as the netting is installed. Um, and then there's also a, a, a another phased approach um, that would be coming back to the council, and that would be putting in deterrents directly under the fishermen's. There's um, some blocking and piping and so forth that the pigeons can roost in that area. Um, the netting won't work because it's too close um, for the public to have access to the netting in that area. Okay. So there's really, a, it's a three-pronged phase approach, so to speak. So the netting will not be placed until the birds are rehomed and the sick ones taken care of. We're not going to put the netting in first. That's assuming we can find, if the council would prefer that, to have a humane use for the, the pigeons. There are um, companies out there that do um, rehoming, but they use them for, um, you know, sporting, um, training, oh. other falconeering, and, and so forth. Okay. Um, so I would recommend uh, or ask the clerk staff. We had a gentleman here when we first talked about the budget and the netting. He was in a wheelchair and he stayed until the end to speak. And he said this is what he does and has for many years. And he talked about how he, uh, he was humane and that they took care of the birds for their lifetime. Whether that's true or not, I mean, that I appreciate. We definitely have to find that out. But can staff try to find that gentleman? Because he came and we did not understand what he meant at the time or was talking about. Um, can I have Cynthia Mallett, environmental programs yes. um, supervisor, answer that question? She okay. spoke to him after the meeting and um, contacted him as okay. well. Okay, thank you. Honorable Mayor, City Council Members, Cynthia Mallett, Environmental Program Supervisor. Uh, in that memo that uh, City Manager passed along to you, there was information from that particular gentleman that would be willing to rehome the pigeons, five to 800 pigeons, for $65,000 to an aviary. I've requested more information from them as to 
where the aviary is located, that type of thing. And I have not received that information back yet, but as soon as I hear from them, we're going to be coming back to you with information specific to that. That would be our preferred rehoming option. Okay. And that's the only option we have right now. I have not been able to locate another type of aviary or another humane way to rehome the pigeons. Okay. I appreciate that you spoke to him because he did stay, and it sounded like that's what he did. Uh, we just didn't understand it at the time until mm -hmm. we could research it more. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any other questions for staff? Before the council uh, moves the item, um, I do have one disclaimer. There is an error in the construction contract costs in the recommended action number two. Um, the amount shown is $1,953,500, and that should be changed to $1,164,100. Well, that's a great change. Slight difference. <laughs> oh, I apologize so for that. Cost savings already. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. So I move that we approve the plans and specifications for the San Clemente Municipal Peer Repair and Understory Bird Deterrent Project Numbers 16811 and 18810, respectively. We also approve and authorize the mayor to execute contract C1739 by and between the City of San Clemente and Associated Pacific Contractors Incorporated, providing for the construction of the San Clemente Municipal Pier Repair and Understory Bird Deterrent in the amount of $1,164,100, and that we um, encourage staff to find a humane solution for the pigeons. I believe we had one speaker card. Oh. oh. Courage, Gregory. We do. Can we put a second on that? But, first? yeah. So motion by Donchek, second by Ham. And we have one speaker card, but I didn't know if the gentleman was still here. Uh, George? How can you miss me? Oh, it's Gregory. I could not read this. Sorry. I think you changed your writing. I could not read it as Gregory. I thought it was someone else. He wrote okay. the back of his truck on his ladder. Go ahead. George Gregory, North Beach, criminal. Obviously, we got to take care of the pier. But why do we got to take care of pigeons? People call them the love bird. Yes, the French love them. They call them squab. They have them with reduced wines, onions, and garlic. It's ludicrous that we can spend $164,000 on the health and safety of pigeons when we can't even build sidewalks for the health and safety of our community. That would cover an extra officer for three years, more or less, two years, in, in, in sidewalks, uh, $10 a square foot, that's a uh, mm, Help me out here. 16,000 running or 16,000 square feet divided by four foot wide. That's 4,000 lineal feet, four feet wide of sidewalks, almost a mile. For the health and safety of our citizens, there will always be pigeons. Don't worry about these pigeons. Call the county vector. That's what they do. They get rid of pigeons. If they're going to get fed to hawks or if somebody wants to trap them and take them away humanely, God bless them. You know, what a great plan, especially if it costs us nothing. But $164,000 for the health and safety of pigeons is ludicrous. It's really mad, really mean, okay? I mean, they buy a lot of buckets for Al in the hall water. Thank you. Thank you, Alan Corson. <laughs> I never thought I was gonna be almost on the same side as him. Um, he started out okay, and uh, but that's not the plan for the pigeons. The, the, the pier was built by Ole Hansen, what, 1927, 1930? And there have been pigeons on there ever since the pier was built. There has never been a problem with the ocean water until we had a major rainstorm last winter. Why are you so anxious to spend $160,000 to put nets underneath the pier? I don't get it. George was right. Use the money for something else. I know it comes out of a separate fund and you got it there. Gee, it's there. Let's spend it. Spend it on something else. It doesn't have to be spent on putting netting underneath the pier. Those piers, those pigeons have truly been there for a long time. I mean, our kids are now close to 50 and we used to go down there and look at the pigeons and they'd fly away and they'd have all the stuff and everything. There are many fewer of them now than there were then, and there was no pollution problem. 
anywhere along underneath the pier or whatever. So please look at other tests, other resources, other studies. Don't rush to judgment and start putting $164,000 worth of nets underneath the pier to get rid of a questionable problem. Thank you very much. Cynthia, can you come up before we actually take a vote? Uh, can you address why we're doing this, uh, the water quality issue, uh, yes. so that the public knows why we are looking at <coughs> the pigeon? Correct. So a couple of years ago, water quality sampling began underneath the pier. And that is when we started seeing bacteria exceedances. Because up till then, we were monitoring north and south of the pier. We still do that. When they added this additional site, that's when the bacteria exceedances started occurring. Although people are not supposed to necessarily recreate or swim underneath there, we know that people can walk and wade underneath the pier. And we are under a bacteria total maximum daily load requirement where we are required to reduce the amount of bacteria load that's in the water. If the city does not meet those bacteria load requirements, we can be in violation uh, and be severely fined, up to $10,000 a day. And this problem is occurring in multiple locations throughout this, uh, the state of California. Uh, Redondo Beach, Santa Cruz, Oceanside had a problem. They did install netting in mid-1990s, and once they installed netting, they did not have the bacteria exceedances right underneath the pier. So that is the one of the reasons to uh, also have that netting installed, is to uh, reduce the amount of fecal matter that's falling from the pigeons roosting and nesting underneath the pier into the water. Okay, I was with you until you said that last statement. So that sounds terrible, that it's going to be catching it, you know. So I think we need to reduce the population, you know, because that's going to look terrible when you're underneath the pier and the netting's up there. With it's pretty. If they can, we hope that they can't get in. They will not be able to get within the netting. Yeah. Okay. We, once, if netting is installed, if net is, netting is installed, the birds will be shooed away, um, or we will have a humane uh, solution to rehome the a quantity of pigeons so that we don't have the amount of pigeons that are down there. But they will not be able to roost underneath the pier. Yes. <coughs> um, and I just like, to, uh, not the environmental project, but the overall pier project itself, I just want to add to this being in. in a support group of, of uh, construction industry generally it's a whole lot cheaper to have something like this done while we're doing a major uh, major rework of the, of the pier I mean this is about 10% less than 10% of what the total pier is so I'm assuming I'm, I'm, I would like to if you can confirm the fact that the, the dollar amount we're looking at the 160 grand we're looking at which is total with contingencies and everything else could be a lot more if we decided to wait it off and push it down the road and then have to do it later on it, it usually saves uh, money when you have a contractor that's out there currently working and working on a very large project so it made sense to combine this work with the overall peer rehab construction okay so we have a motion motion and second did you make the motion? Okay, motion by Don Check, second by him. All in favor? Aye. Passes 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. I'm losing my voice. Next is a report from the Public Works Director, City Engineer, concerning approval of an integrated <laughs> pest management policy. Good evening, Mayor Ward, and members of the Council. So, the item before you tonight is for your consideration to approve a proposed integrated pest management policy. I know you've read the report by way of very brief background. This item came originally by citizen request to the Beaches, Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, they did form a subcommittee to study the matter. Um, as the report indicated, we don't have a formal policy. Uh, the report did outline the process that went through and ultimately that was deliberated and considered by the Beaches and Parks Recreation Commission and they have recommended to forward and seek your approval of the policy that's attached to the report. Um, 
With that, that's my brief overview. I do need to mention though, um, and I'm not sure if you saw it yet, very late today, um, we did receive a letter from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. I forwarded that to you, but you may have already been in closed session. So um, I have a hard copy here. I will summarize the gist by saying that they are in opposition to the policy, not because they uh, support the ultimate goal, but I think it, um, I will just read two brief excerpts that summarize their opposition. Um, and we didn't know this was coming. Like I said, I literally got this um, late today. But their specific concern is that the policy requires the use of organic pesticides, and I'm directly quoting from the letter, without an explicit consideration of the public health risk or effectiveness of organic pesticides compared to synthetic pesticides. In short, their concern is that um, the current policy as proposed doesn't allow for the use of synthetic chemicals when they could remain a viable option. In other words, they don't, they're opposed to taking a potential tool out of the toolbox that the city might use, and their concern is primarily focused on dealing with the um, prevention of and spread of invasive plants. And, and in fish and wildlife's view, um, sometimes um, organics are either ineffective or do more harm, and synthetics do have a place. But as I mentioned in your report, the way we currently have it structured, it would be hard to imagine using synthetic pesticides simply for the control of weeds or by extension invasives, because we don't know if that by itself could ever be deemed a public health risk. Um, in and of themselves. So I, I wanted to share that. I do apologize. Like I said, we got that um, very late today. And um, I just wanted to get that in the record. And with that, I'm sure you have questions, and I'll be ready to answer any. Uh, uh, what I'd like to propose is that we give staff time to digest this, because um, I'm on a committee with Jonathan Snyder, and I have very high respect for what his group does. And since this came in at the 11th hour, maybe we want to consider the, the input and have it brought back at a later time? I, I think so. A part of, I'd, if I could build on just a few things I'd like to, I was going to also suggest it gets pushed off because a lot of what, a lot of the staff report and these things talk about what Irvine has done, but the fiscal impact uh, of choosing to, to go this direction is, we can measure what that would be. Irvine had a 5% increase in their maintenance costs. That's a $20 million budget. That's $1 million they're paying more per year under this program. So there has to be some measurable impact fiscally to the city that we have to know about um, and, and also have to be able to balance the effectiveness of it. One thing I will say is that I, I, I think that um, there's also a, an example much closer to home is Talega Homeowners Association made the decision to move away from um, the uh, Roundup uh, methods and, and that was, uh, I think it was earlier this year, last year. Um, I'd like to know how, what their experience has been on it and, and see you know how, how that's worked in San Clemente, which is much closer to home in, in a similar type of policy. Because this has grown from orig originally it was no roundup, right, to all of a sudden we can't even kill rats without using organic pesticides. And so that, it, that's, that's the part that's going to be is we're talking about pest control, but everything I'm reading here is regarding weed control. And um, organically controlling some of our, our weeds in that area, I can I can see that's yeah, it's possible. It might be provable, but with disease outbreak, with virus outbreak, and mosquito problems, and everything else that we're, 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 we're potentially looking at as far as risk goes, I'd like to have a lot more. I would I would like the ones that object to it to give us a, a better answer of what we should be doing. It's yeah. just, it, it, it concerns me a lot. Well, well, whether it's Eric, Tim's idea or Lori's idea, I'm going to support it. So I think one of you guys should make a motion. So um, I, I'll, I'll move that we bring it back uh, at a different time uh, with perhaps more opinions, uh, with, a, with a greater opinion from the folks at the Fish and Wildlife area, because that's obviously disconcerting, um, that information. I'd like to know more about the fiscal impact, maybe some lesson learns from Talega and what happened there uh, with their use of it. And it's also taking the totality of the Irvine policy, which has, by the way, a very different fiscal position hmm. and implementing it in San Clemente and it doesn't feel like there's been any like consideration for how it would work locally and, and what happens so I mean we're beachside community does that play into it and so I I think it deserves a little bit more um, look at it and also um, 
it hasn't gone outside the original scope of what's intended. Looking at Roundup and pesticides in the parks was, I think, a worthy goal. Talking about you know this broadening of the project, I think, has gone outside. I think what the original scope was, and so I'd really like to contemplate what do we want to accomplish here. So uh, you know, uh, and objectives. I'd also like to add um, in the follow-up work. I see that Rancho Mission Viejo Company, uh, their uh, conf uh, uh, conservancy folks were copied on this Fish and Wildlife Memo. Can you check in with them? Because, um, you know, a lot of these things don't respect the borders that somebody put on a map. So if there's going to be an unintended consequence of something we do that might spill over to an important uh, conservancy adjacent to the city, I'd like to know that as well. Or at least let them know what we're contemplating. Tom, uh, adding on that, this is out of the Carlsbad office, which that might be the local office, but it is. could this have anything to do with the San Diego uh, management plan for environmental that does include uh, the wildlife corridors and Rancho Mission Viejo? It doesn't necessarily include us, but there's a huge plan for Camp Pendleton and Rancho Mission Viejo and all of that. And could that be why they're weighing in on it? Because they, they were worried about invasive species in the natural core. I had a brief discussion again when this was transmitted with the gentleman and and, and basically um, in that short conversation I don't know if that's the case and we can certainly ask them more but what he indicated that um, a local branch of a statewide um, prevention of invasive plant species something along those lines someone contacted Fish and Wildlife let them know San Clemente was considering this we actually never staff never even frankly consider reaching out to people like Fish and Wildlife we we didn't expect um, this position frankly it was surprising not that it doesn't make sense it just so they found out about it that way and it, it was simply to try and get on the record and with some of their concerns they were aware of the Irvine policy that is now being exported and they weren't able to um, get on the boat Wait so in. to speak for that they were aware of ours and wanted to at least um, give your counsel their views has vector control also weighed in on on the Irvine policy I don't know that we could find out or talk with them directly on on who all the commenters were of that yeah, because one of the byproducts of the Irvine policy is they had an increase in pests you know cockroaches right. and rats be proliferated under the policy and so I'm assuming they also would have an opinion uh, about that we'll so. check with them I just want to be clear we I think are feeling fairly good and we'll come back with more detail that we, we are still going to be allowed because certainly with with vectors and rodent control and, and those kind of pests we'll have the ability even under this proposed policy to use whatever ultimately at the end of the day we need to um, to be effective to deal with that because that clearly is a human health threat and so um, because the terms pesticide herbicide and uh, those are all interchanged and, and they include dealing with weeds to live critters um, but I but I hear your feedback loud and clear and we will work on it more and try and flush out those issues and, so I'll second your motion yeah okay we do have, we do have one card yeah, Cecilia Kucher are you still here good evening council later than I thought later than I hoped but um, I'm representing the Orange County chapter of the California Native Plant Society, and I think I'm the group that talked to Fish and Wildlife. The person who spoke to them said, hey, do you know this is going on? Um, so anyway, we're concerned, of course, being native plant people. We're concerned with the health and management of native plants and vegetation throughout Orange County. So naturally, then, we're concerned that a blanket city policy to not allow synthetic herbicide use will tie the city's hands when dealing with invasive plants in the city's beautiful natural open spaces. And you do have some lovely canyons. According to city maintenance staff that I've spoken to, they do not use, <coughs> not use herbicides at all in their management of the natural areas that, 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 that manage of the trails that go through the natural areas. However, the use of synthetic herbicides should in those areas should be remain an available option. Synthetic herbicides are a tool to deal with infestation of noxic, noxious 
highly invasive weeds that may threaten to degrade the city's beautiful natural open spaces. For example, one of the biggest invasive weed issues in San Clemente city wildlands is artichoke thistle. Uh, San Clemente may have some of the heaviest infestations of any city in the county, and almost all of these are away from schools, parks, and other public areas. Managing artichoke thistle is possible without synthetic herbicides, but it takes considerably more time and effort and is therefore more expensive for the city, which is to say it's more expensive for the taxpayers. We are aware that a majority of the natural open spaces within the city are owned by the homeowners associations. associations. Two of these uh, were developments are the, the Forster Ranch in Taliga were permitted by Fish and Wildlife Service under a 4D interim habitat loss permit or permits. Uh, such permits are a mechanism that allowed development to move forward during planning for the southern subregion and CCP, HCP, as you know, Habitat Natural Communities Conservation Program, which is a state program, and the Habitat Conservation Program is federal. The Habitat Management Plans that are to result from such permitting are still being set up, but will be finalized at some time. At that time, the Forster Ranch and Taliga open spaces will be restored and managed in, under the uh, HCP provisions. That work will be much more easily done if it is not hobbled by a city ordinance prescribing the use of a very useful tool, synthetic herbicides. We, the Native Plant Society, request that the in integrated pest management policy be modified to exempt the natural open spaces from the proscription against synthetic herbicides. Thank you. Thank and you also, much. for your information, enough of those to go around for most everybody. Is that from your organization? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can we provide one of those to Tom Bongan? You may have, you may provide them, you may copy them, reproduce them as much as you like to hand out to everybody you think is useful. Okay, thank you um, very much. Can, and could I have your they name? Because, you know, we are so committed to protecting our open space. We have almost 50% of San Clemente is open space. I'd love to be able to get in touch with you as we look at ways. To, ah. Laura. Oh, she has her card. Okay, good. I was going to ask Maybe, if Anybody else want a card? Well, here, have some. Um, okay. I wanted to say about the list I gave you that has some bearing also on your discussion about the trees around the the water tower and the trees on Esplandian. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any more questions? No more discussion? No? Okay, so we have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Brown and a second by Council Member Donchek is uh, thank you. Um, all in favor? Aye. Five zero, and we're going to push this off. And we'll, we'll work with the city manager's okay. office on when to return this for your consideration. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oral communications part two, I don't have any cards. City manager? No. City attorney? Uh, nothing else tonight, thanks. City position on resolutions being considered by the League of California Cities at the 2017 annual conference. Uh, the City Council uh, previously appointed the city manager to serve as the city's voting rep, uh, voting delegate at the 2017 General Assembly of the League of California Cities. The General Assembly will consider adopting two resolutions. So I adopt I uh, agendize this item. Uh, to enable council to take positions on those resolutions so that uh, uh, city manager or his alternate, which is assistant city manager, can appropriately represent the city positions at the uh, General Assembly meeting. Okay, so the first one that we have to consider is a resolution calling upon the governor and the legislator to entertain discussions with the league and other public safety stakeholders to identify and implement strategies that will reduce the unintended negative effects of existing criminal law. 
all the measures that were recently passed. But I don't believe the report stated what the measures, how they, they would do it. I think that will be coming up at the league conference, correct? I don't remember reading that. Yeah. But that doesn't matter. Really what we're asked to do is vote Just give it whether, we, whether we, we want them to do that. No one has any comments? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm good on both of them. Yeah. And the second one's very important because local control on uh, having direct emergency medical response within our jurisdiction. So we definitely want to keep that. Okay. So okay. Support both. So we'll support both of those. Okay. And um, I'd also like to ask uh, the city manager, or if it's going to be Eric, on Wednesday, September 13th, in conference room 304-05 from 345 to 5 p.m. is the um, coastal cities um, meeting. I'd like to make sure we have a representative there just to hear what their issues are and see if that's going to be a viable um, forum for San Clemente. Ordinance number 1644 for second reading that relates to speed zones on Avenue de La Pata. Yeah, I move that we adopt ordinance number 1644 entitled an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Clemente, California, amending Chapter 10, Municipal Code concerning speed zones on Avenue de La Pata. Second. Motion by him, second by sports. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 5 0. Move that we adjourn to the oh, next yeah. regular. I, oh. yeah. She passed it because, well, <laughs> she well, went to the what was, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. You can't. You are clever. You can't do that and give me stuff that I have oh, to that's read. That's right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Does anyone else have? Do you have anything? Yeah, I do. I, I just want. Are we okay? I just want to put it out there for some the people that are obviously gone um, that may want to fast forward and look at. What we did at the end of the meeting, um, in in regarding there there is a, an awful awful lot of concern in regarding the homeless issue, the encampments issue, uh, issues throughout our city, uh, and I just want to, to pass on the fact that uh, city staff, city council, our sheriff's department have been working diligently for months in finding ways to curtail and eliminate a lot of the problems that we have uh, we do have to do things legally uh, and what we do have though are some ordinances that we're digging out that may allow us to even be um, stronger in a more effective way in dealing with this but we're working on it we're working through it it's 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 not done overnight but um, uh, I can tell you that everyone here has been diligently coming up with suggestions and ways to solve the problem. And the problem isn't going to go away. We have to solve it, and we are aware of that. So that was what I wanted to say. Okay. <clears throat> I was asked to uh, read this. Each year, the city of San Clemente offers a citizen's academy known as the Leadership San Clemente. It is free to San Clemente citizens. The 2017 program will take place every Thursday from 6 o'clock to 8.30 p.m., commencing on September 21st, 2017. Each class will focus on a different aspect of San Clemente's municipal government, which includes general government, finance, administrative services, community development, public works, beaches, parks and rec, law enforcement, fire services, and the Capistrano Unified School District. The final session will take place on November 9th. There's a tour of the city that includes a, it's a nice bus tour. If you've never taken it, it's a great tour, uh, followed by a graduate ceremony and reception at Casa Ramonica. Um, there's still a few spots. That's why we're reading this. If you would like to participate in this year's class, please call 361-8200 to request an application or log on to www.sanclemente.org on our website to download an application. If you've ever wanted to get involved in San Clemente, um, I highly recommend taking this class. I think a lot of us did. Did you take it? Actually, With the exception of Chris Ham. But he was born here, so he knows more than yes. most. I already 
and you work for the city, you know every street, I'm sure. Um, the second announcement that I would like to make, and I'm sorry I didn't give this to you, I, it came in the mail, it's for the Pet Project Foundation, which is our uh, animal shelter that we share for with Dana Point. They are having a fundraiser September 24th on a Sunday. It is called the Tale of Two Cities Gala. It is a Western theme. It will have line dancing, uh, food. It's held at Bella Kalina. And um, I'm going to ask that everyone supports it. And I would ask staff if we could put this up on our website. I'll give it to you, the flyer, um, so that we can promote that. The animal shelter cannot, they do a great job, but they can't do it without the support of the people. So uh, I would like to announce that. And that's all for my announcements. Uh, to dovetail on the, um, the a leadership class, uh, for all of those that believe they know better or know how the city should be run or are concerned about various aspects of the city, um, you really, really should have taken this leadership course because it gives you a complete picture of the variety of things that the city does and who's doing them. So you won't have to guess or you won't have to complain that you don't know who's doing what. It is a great opportunity for you to see what's going on here and you can understand where the what your concerns are about issues. What I'm trying to say is it's better to be educated and talk about the problems than to be not. So take advantage of it. I have a couple things. Okay. Uh, the first one is to talk about the uh, Public Safety Task Force or subcommittee that Steve and I are on that you sat in for uh, earlier this month. Uh, the main thing that we got out of it was we had the, uh, as she called herself, the homeless czar from the county come down and speak about a very fitting issue that Steve just brought up, which is homelessness in the county. And compared to the rest of the county, we're doing pretty well in terms of homelessness in our community. And she uh, presented a lot of good options, a lot of good ways to work through uh, the issues that we do have in this community. So that's what you missed there, Steve. That was pretty much the bulk of the meeting. Um, Besides that, I was going to adjourn in honor of a firefighter that we lost this week. So I just wanted to bring that up for us. You don't have anything? Go ahead and adjourn. Tim, you have anything? So with that, I move that we adjourn in honor of uh, Mary Blau. She was a 27-year uh, career firefighter for the Orange County Fire Authority. She recently passed away from bone cancer. And with that, we'll adjourn to the next regular council meeting, which will be held on September 19, 2017. And the council chamber is located at 100 Avenue to Presidio, San Clemente, California. Closed session might as well be considered 5 p.m. The regular business meeting will commence at 6 p.m. Second. Motion by Ham, second by Mayor Pro Tem Brown. All in favor? Aye. Passes 5-0.